uh, or microalgaes, uh, that, that's kind of like similar systems. So what is we've been doing is that we all know there are all these uh, nice plants out there, uh, either in fields or in in the forest or some meadows somewhere, and they have some nice genes. We get full genomes these days. Uh, people still think it's a big issue. We we're currently part of a big project together with the Beijing Genome Institute in in, in well the Sichuan part, which is not in Beijing, but in China, uh, on sequencing uh, ten thousand plants. And uh, our part is a small part. We only we have about fifty uh, full genome plants, but but ten thousand is a huge change because currently you have full genomes about forty plants or including uh, LTs. So that's going to be a huge change uh, in the future. But all these genes, we can put them in somewhere and then we want to make some products. Our focus has been on fragrances, production of fragrances for the purpose of uh, making products for the perfume industry or um, yeah, soaps and home products and whatever, whatever have you. Um, mosses. I mean, uh, lots of people ask me, why do you work with mosses? I will come back to a bit why it's so super cool. But uh, actually, you can already get moss products on the market. And uh, this is a cosmetic industry. This is actually an old slide because Mibel uh, released another product um, just last last week, um, which is also based on the moss uh, collaboration. They have a generate green renovation, which is not called renovation. They are called Ediva Bioscience. Um, again, they recently changed their names to Ediva Bioscience and are based in Dortmund, Germany. Um, you can also find all these nice uh, terrariums around the world. You can buy terrariums of mosses and lots of people like that. And it's kind of like greening of the world. And then uh, we'll get back to this product here over on your right hand side. So, um, for most of the time, I will be talking about Fisco Mitrella, uh, which is the moss that was established at um, model plant back in the 1950s, so a long time ago. The full genome is available for you. Uh, in terms of terpenoids, which is what it's a chemical structures that most fragrances are, or many fragrances are part of, it's very clean. It only produces one kind of terpenoids, which is really unique to, uh, to plants. Um, and, and also within mosses, it's very unique, actually. Um, but mosses are simple. They grow uh, fast compared to, to higher plants, um, even though you, when you look at them, they're not very tall, but that's all of the mutations. Uh, and they can grow submerged in water, uh, which is really nice. So they are like this in between an algae and a plant, but they are actually a real plant. So they behave like real plants, uh, not like vascular plants because they don't have vascular system, but they behave, everything else is uh, like real plants. One benefit is that you can do homologous recombination in, in mosses compared to higher plants. Um, even with CRISPR, that is a huge uh, improvement and gives you much better uh, transformation rates. So that's what we've been doing. Um, we When we do the transformation, we try to make it easy. This is a, a, also relating back to the protocol that you were talking about that came out uh, last year from the collaboration uh, from a very successful marble team, I would say last year, uh, through the roof successful with tons of metals and uh, I don't know, whatever. I don't think that's ever happened before. Uh, so you should go back and watch those videos from their uh, successions. It's a very inspirational project they did last year. Um, anyway, Make it easy for yourself, right? Uh, everybody who works in synthetic biology, you know, you're never, never, never going to clone genes again. Right? We did that in the past. Don't do it again. You just buy the DNA. Um, you wait a few days. Um, you get it shipped. You select whatever you want to do. You have a selection. We use uh, fluorescence, actually, some, most of the time for, for selection. And it's um, and our, L, no, our yeast and... Um, uh, Uncle friends, they of course always ask you why isn't you don't use red fluorescence, and then you just look at them and you you miss your biology classes back in the days. And um, but, but of course because there are photosystems and they are red fluorescent, so that's why you don't do that. You wait weeks. Mosses takes you a couple of weeks, not years like other plants, and you do the chemical analysis, and you're ready for large scale production. Uh, and the cool thing here is that you do a stable transformer that you can 
directly uh, utilize in a later production system. So you don't have to go back and retransform or redo anything. So the same cells can be recycled, just like in yeast and uh, SPT life. One of the projects we've been working a lot on also actually uh, tried to convince some IGM students to look into this, and they helped us a bit on the fat part, uh, not so much on the muscle part, but on the fat part. It's just to give you an example, what is it that you can do with plants um, and with some of these cells is that, well, uh, one of the big issues we'll also touch upon, they, well, they're maybe not high maintenance, but they don't grow as fast as E. coli uh, or Vibrio for that sake, that would be even you nice right 10 minutes in docking time um so that is a project we've been looking into can we make them grow faster and can we make them grow more fat uh, because fat is uh, an interesting storage compartment uh, when you make small molecules um, and um, maybe you some of you remember this but this is a general um, um cell cycle you have the d1 phase the s phase the d2 and the mitosis and then um, you also have a T0 phase, which is where plant cells spend most of the time. It's super annoying. They are spending most of the time in the T0 phase, building up energy. And what we looked into, can we kick this out of them? Can we get them to move back to the T1 phase? And there are some checkpoints here at the T1 to the S and T2 to the mitosis that you can utilize. Um, so we did a lot of engineering and to cut a short story, a long story short, say uh, we overexpressed the, the two cycling kinases a1 a2 and the cycling and, and the cyclines d1 and d2 in a MOS system and if you look here this is where it gets really interesting so here you have two different situations um, we have a growth where we stop all the cells uh, in the d2 phase that's uh, when you use ammonium tartrate here so the plus and that goes for most cells, actually, or most eukaryotic cells. That if you grow them on ammonium tartrate, you stop them at the T2 uh, phase, so they don't go into the D2 phase. And then our muscles looks a bit weird, but it looks this is the wild type growth. And what you should focus on here is this uh, lower right hand corner, which is the all four overexpressed uh, mutant, and um, and this has uh, some really crazy phenotype here there's a lot of uh, protonemal growth and gamete, uh, gametophyte growth here with the ammonium tartrate it's even more funny when we look without the ammonium tartrate so the lower lower right hand picture here you can see these very big uh, muscles compared to the wild type and they are the same age and of course start with one protonemal cell um so what we do when we do this individually uh, express these things in uh, Apodopsis. So in higher plants, what we see is dwarf mutants, but what we see here is this gigantic moss mutant, which gave, uh, led us to the name of this monster that turned into the monster uh, moss. Uh, and then again, that's a cool idea. So you also use that in your IGN presentation. If you come up with like funny names that are catchy, then the judges will remember that and you will uh, gain some free points, you could say, in that sense. Uh, that's coming from a judge, um, so so don't worry. Um, so this is just some of the data we was uh, we had, and one of the questions we were thinking about is, do we actually have more starch content? What is the change in the energy levels in cells? Because you can see here on the, your right hand side that they are actually quite big um, compared to the wild type. But looking into the starch content, so that be I mean, is there like an energy loss? That's what we fear that the starch content in all four mutant over here. Would be much lower and that didn't happen so the stars is the same the photosystems are active there is the same amount of photosynthesis going on and in that sense what we generated was just a, a bigger moss and uh, that's growing slightly faster than the uh, than the wild type um it's built basically this is based on cell elongations turns out uh, after several years of, of looking into this so that was the uh, the the speeds. Uh, you would say we it can be done, and uh, it's it's uh, quite a provocative thing to suggest to, to plant research, um, because there's a lot of things you need to use for the T T zero phase. But one has to remember that when you don't grow things in the field, the competition is different, and you have different lights schemes. You can have much more lights. The same in vertical farming. 
you could probably use some of the same tricks here to create, get more, it could be letters or other things uh, faster. Um, the other thing is uh, when you work with, with plants and the, or, or algae actually as well is the lipids and lipids is a part of the storage systems in cells, uh, very important in green cells, this, uh, these lipid bodies or lipid droplets. And, and we, we thought it was, could be interesting to see, can we utilize these lipid droplets as a storage compartment? Because then if you think about it, okay, then it's just like cream. When you've grown your cells for a long time, you break them open and all this lipid comes to the top. And if your product of interest is part of the lipid droplets and you skim it off and you, you uh, lower the downstream processing of your, of your engineering tasks here. So, so that's some of the things we've been, we've been playing around with on these lipid droplets. And um, our idea was to see, okay, we have uh, different lipid body associated proteins. And we have the small rubber proteins, we have oleosins, and we have sapines. And could we then, as you see here on your right-hand side, could we then link the biosynthesis of small molecules to, uh, to these, to these uh, proteins and then ensure that our, our product would be stored inside the lipid products? The, the, that's kind of like the idea about everything. Um, it didn't really maybe work that well, but it gave us a lot of the interesting results in terms of lipid droplets uh, anyway. Um, as you can see here, um, when you have the wild type here, the lipid droplets is the green dots on the screen. The red is of course the chloroplast, as we mentioned before. Um, so in the wild type, you have few lipid droplets in a in a leaf moss, so in a real moss. If you take liverworts, which is also a bryophyte, that would be very different to picture. There would be lots of green, green dots here in the wild type. Uh, but then um, overexpressing some of these uh, genes, the sapines here, the oleosins, and the small rock protein, it's very easy to see that the overexpression itself leads to uh, either more or bigger lipid droplets, as we see here with the sapines. Adding then production of a uh, small molecule, in this sense, pat patchouli, patchouli as uh, a terpenoid, stresses the cell so much so that it's just saying, okay, I need to make more of these lipid droplets to store these uh, nasty compounds that are going to kill me at some point. So that's kind of like what you see here on your right-hand side of these pictures is that there's a lot more uh, lipid droplets inside the cells, and they're also bigger in some sense. Uh, this you of course can quantify. Um, so we did that with some quantifications of the di diameter, uh, diameter and the volumes of them. And uh, I think the increase is pretty pronounced uh, in all of these. Uh, even with just these production alone, we have a higher increase in, in these uh, different problems. So, so it does work. We can do it. Uh, what we were trying to figure out, do we actually have more of our patchouli, uh, patchouli uh, inside the lipid droplets compared to when we just produce the patchouli. And this is not so much difference. I mean, that's actually not significant the difference you see over here. 31% is normally what we would see is inside the lipid droplets. And we get up to like 43%. That's not very promising. Um, so that, there's a lot of things that need to be fixed in that situation with the patchouli and it's, Probably is true for many others, the small molecules that would like to produce. So you can actually make fat monsters, um, monsters with more fat that grows faster, so that is actually possible. And then actually what I promised also to trust upon is uh, the, the commercial part of this, and we've been working now for six years on uh, in Mospiration, uh, as the company that we, that we founded uh, back in 2016 and on the production of uh, fragrances. And we started out with patchouli. Uh, so patchouli, it's uh, used a lot and it's used in all, is it 80 or 90% of all male perfumes that you buy today? And it has been for many, many years. Um, so there's a lot of uh, patchouli used every year in the, in the perfume market. Uh, we can make 1.3 milligrams per liter. That is like maybe a thousand fold too low. Um, we could probably, 100 times more would probably make somewhat interesting product, but still way too low to what is interesting at the moment. So 
growing these things in big bags is is not very uh, very useful uh, at this with this level. Um, we also tried to make some other molecules, and again, we we ended up with these small levels of molecules. So there's a lot of op optimization you could say we need to be doing. Uh, if you compare with yeast, uh, where there's a few uh, fragrances produced in the in, of the same type of molecules, terpenoids. Um, it's about 15 to 20 years of research from several research groups and several companies have been involved. So a lot more people are actually working on these optimization steps. But this is where we probably can utilize, uh, maybe not IGM, but then uh, at least a synthetic biology approach that you, you design your DNA and do the cells in a much smaller way than what you used to do. Uh, so, so there's a hope that we can sidestep some of these things. Uh, but you could say the, the this product is still going. And it's not just dead because of we we are, we're not focusing so much on the oil production itself. So instead, we we've been focusing a bit on uh, how else can we use this. Um, so uh, here you have to imagine that uh, I was at a conference in 2017 in San Francisco uh, presenting uh, uh, these data. Oh. Uh, these ones with the production and uh, some of these ideas. And I brought the moss uh, just for fun uh, with me um, on a petri dish. Uh, they're not very big, so it was pretty easy to have it in my, my suitcase. And uh, then I was contacted after the presentation I was giving by a, a designer. And he said, hey, uh, Henrik, um, this is really cool. Uh, what what does this moss look like? What is it fragrant or whatever? And then I pulled out the moss from my 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 bag and showed him, yeah, it's fragrant, it smells like patchouli. And he came up with these designs, as you can see, different kinds of designs uh, for for a, a new product. And um, this is a GM, uh, so a GM organism. So it's a genetically modified, and it, one of the nasty ones is uh, because it's trans genes. We take genes from others. Uh, species and put into them, right? So it's really have to be really careful with the legislation and your, I mean, there and also with how you make them. And this is one of the reasons why we use fluorescence uh, for selection is that we don't want antibiotics uh, or any resistance to be present of these products. And um, so this is actually on the market today. Um, currently, the production is a bit on hold, uh, so that's also if you you cannot buy it right now as it is. But Patch Botanics is a Oklahoma-based company. And uh, is trying to to grow these at a light, slightly bigger scale than what we do in our 100 milliliter reactors in the lab in, in the university, and see if they can make a viable product and then make this on the market. So going around and then showing people what you're doing, and which is also why uh, this is what a major part of uh, IGM actually is all this uh, human practice an integrated human practice. Um, and, and this is an example of how talking with people outside your field actually change the scope of what you've been doing. So, so this is the final product we have right now. We have three frequencies on the market. Or, well, when they get to grow them, I mean, I hope that will be fixed within a couple of weeks, actually, so, uh, so they can get on with this. But um, else uh, we'll have to find some other solutions. But it's, it's currently quite interesting. Uh, there's a lot of things. So, so lots of people have been part of uh, the whole endeavor of the MOST projects. Uh, see the IGM team in 2019 has also been heavily involved. The 2015 teams so are also very nicely uh, worked out. Um, especially Hansel, who is the co-founder of Mospiration. We've been it's been quite an endeavor on the, getting to where we are right now with having a product on the market in the United States um, that actually is being sold. Um, the customers. Um, so I think I will start with that just to give you like, it was a fast tour about in, in muscles and what you can do um, with an overview and not super technical. So, and I'm ready for questions if there's any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Simonsen. So yeah, if anyone has a question, please feel free to either unmute yourself, um, send it to the chat. We also have the mirror. We can send the link again. I personally have a question. So I found really interesting that you have already a product 
on the market. Um, I wanted to know what are the biosafety or biosecurity measures that you have to take? Because considering that if someone really wanted, they could break it and propagate the moss or not. Yeah, you could do that, but then you are violating the uh, contract that you signed with the company when you buy the stuff. Mm -hmm. And then this being United States, we will pay some lawyers and we'll come and sue you for, uh, I would guess like, let's just agree on 10 million US dollars and then we have an agreement, uh, uh, something like that. No, so the, yes, of course you can do that. And that is um, that is the big scare. But on the other hand, it's not that easy to, I mean, you, you can propagate mosses, but you need to be careful that you don't contaminate them and you just don't have a DLI growing all over, right? I mean, regular mold will normally take over very fast if you're not particular so I'm, I'm not super scared that people will actually do it but of course it can be done mm -hmm. and then we will prosecute hunt them down wherever they are <laughs> is there anything in the mural thing uh, don't um, see it otherwise i would uh, like to ask a little question myself um I wanted to know, uh, I, I was actually a part of the um, iGEM team uh, from last year in Marburg. Um, and like part of our inspiration for our project was that it takes so long to usually uh, do um, like synthetic biology in plants. Um, yeah. Although we also like spe specifically with um, chloroplasts, uh, but in general, uh, how, how long do you usually uh, take like uh, the process to actually uh, work with uh, the genes, etc. in, in moss? Um, is it a very long process? Is it does it work so, very nice? Yeah, so the mutant, if you say stable mutant generation is super short for plants. It's about two months, uh, two and a half months. Um, but what we normally do when we do student projects like the IGEM or shorter student projects, um, also just to test stuff ourselves, we would just use a transient expression. Uh, so that, that again, and that resembles a bit what you see if you do transiently in Nicochana Pensiliana. Um, so, I mean, I think that's, uh, the transient expression is a bit uh, undervalued uh, within the plant community because it tells you a lot about the functionality of the constructs you've made. And actually, it, uh, SARS COVID, uh, the COVID 19 vaccine that Medicago is producing is done transiently. Um, it's transient expression in, in tobacco plants. Uh, there's, there's the same with um, uh, it's an HPV vaccine that's also produced transiently in tobacco, and there's a lot of antibodies and other proteins that are produced transiently in tobacco. So, uh, well, in Nicotiana Benziviana, not not the tobacco plants, but the, so, so I think that system, I mean, utilize the transit expression in plants is, uh, is a way that you could speed up. Um, you'd say they're probably not give you, it's not going to give you the in field production, but is that really what we need um, to some extent? Maybe not. And there we have a bit longer time, you could say. So, so for to compete with other biotech systems, the transiently expressed, is super fast um, and actually faster than what you how you 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 generate your agrobacterium cells and then you express so that almost is equal to expression in E. coli, right? So it's uh, it's I wouldn't I wouldn't be so scared with the speed. I know it's uh, the the what people are thinking, but that's basically because they they maybe are a bit say. I wouldn't say narrow-minded, but haven't seen the possibilities in transient expression. And we do that a lot in MOS as well. Thank you very much. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, in general. Thank you. Other questions? We have one more in the mirror, which says, which other advantages does expressing smells in moss are there apart from novelty? Yeah, I mean, 
in Mrs. Johnson's uh, bathroom, right? In her home somewhere in Midwest, let's just say in Idaho, she would normally have a perfume spray that uh, gener generates a lot of small aerosols and uh, have other adjuvants to it and, and other things. So in that sense, it's a, it's a greener solution to having air fresheners in, in, your, in your home. Um, that is the, the product on the market right now. I could say, I mean, the idea if we fixed, you could say if we fixed the, um, the amount issues in the cells itself in our bioreactors, we would actually be able to produce frequencies that are really close to what is produced in the wild type, uh, in the wild plants. So, and that for patchouli or for sandalwood and others, if, if people are familiar with, with the way those fragrances are produced, it, I mean, it's especially the woody ones like sandalwood, uh, or is there's a one, also one in Southern Sudan, I just uh, forgot what it's called anyway. They're produced in trees, so, and it's the, the, um, the wood in the trees, that, so you need 100 year old trees to, to get your oils, and, um, and you don't get very much oil out of those big trees. Right. And one can just imagine the amount of trees you then need to sustain the global world market for, even though you're only using a little. Um, so in that sense, having a biotech production that is based on cells, if you grow in a tank or in a bioreactor, photobioreactor or something like that, would relieve uh, the use of those uh, forest trees, right? right? And you can just have forest instead. And probably it'll be local, but locally better for the environment so so there are different benefits in that area as well but we do have an issue with the amount okay There are still, I think, uh, one or two more questions in the mirror. Just uh, please read them out because it doesn't link for me. Um, I'm usually not part of the moderation. But... <laughs> I can go. So one here is the, is asking, what is the upkeep of the Moses? What is the what? Sorry, it says the upkeep. I'm not the sure. The... Uh, so, so like, uh, what, so, what, to what you have to do to keep them alive, I guess. <laughs> ah, well, you have to water them, and that's what most customers forget. Uh, okay, that's all. That's all you need to do. Um, you water them, and you water them also maybe with a little of these. Uh, you can get these plant. Uh, Fertilize your things for your house plants, and that's that's all you have to do. But that's what? More, mainly that's what customers forget. So, yeah, uh, the smell will uh, remain though, like over the time. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a constitutive okay. expression, so that will remain. Yeah, perfect. That sounds cool. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Simonson for giving that talk and for the Q&A. Um, I would now like to int introduce our next speaker, Dr. Thank Jason. you very much. And uh, see you in Paris, everyone. I would, Bye. Have a nice day, thank you so much again. Um, I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jake Wintermute. Um, Dr. Wintermute is the developer evangelist at Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, and something important to us iGemmers and student researchers is that um, he has undertaken a lot of um, educational e efforts in synthetic biology, like the Synthetic Biology One channel, which has been really instrumental to both my team and me personally, as we were starting iGem just to gain a basic understanding before getting involved in any of this. Um, and we're really excited for him to talk about um, how synthetic biology can be used for climate action. So thank you so much um, 
and we're ready for your talk. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that introduction. It's great to be here. Wow, look, you, you, it's cool. You made like a, like intro slides and every, it's very, very professional. I was very, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, hi. Hi, it's great to be here. Can, everybody can hear me okay? I hear, I see people nodding. Uh, so, uh, so I guess, I guess people can hear me okay. Um, so I just, before I, before I launch into my slides, um, I just want to, uh, take a minute to introduce myself. So my name is Jake. I work at uh, Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, Ginkgo Bioworks is sort of like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, uh, except for trans genes. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not. Is it? I have okay. I have all. Never mind. I have a whole bunch of jokes. I have a bunch of jokes about about Ginkgo. Maybe I maybe I maybe I won't use them. But um, what I will say is, um, yeah. So my my role is developer evangelist, um, and so that is a con continuation um, in many ways of the kind of educational outreach that I was interested in as an academic. Um, but my, my job is to uh, communicate what Ginkgo does, to make our services more accessible uh, to people who might want to become our customers, to become foundry developers, to use Ginkgo's platform to do their, their cell programming uh, projects, and to, to grow the synthetic biology ecosystem in general. Um, so we we think that the more people are building using synthetic biology, that's something that's going to be good for Ginkgo in the long run. Um, and so without further ado, I will launch into my slideshow. Okay, cool. So this is so uh, my title is going to be developing for the foundry era of synthetic biology. And what I'm what I'm hoping to get out of this talk is I want to start a conversation with this community about what is the, the future of genetic engineering, specifically in phototrophs. I think we've already seen um, in just the beginning of this conference, a lot of the, the opportunities that are available in engineering phototropes, we've also seen a lot of the challenges. So there's not a lot of genome sequences available. The growth cycles are slow. It's really, it's it's been, traditionally it's been hard to implement the innovations of synthetic biology into phototrophs with the upshot being that we're, we're moving too slowly. So we're not, we're not, creating enough sustainable products using phototrophs fast enough. Um, and so that means in my view that we, we, all, we need to sort of collectively rethink uh, the way that we're working, the way that we're engineering phototrophs. And I think that the way that we do things at uh, Ginkgo Bioworks can serve as a, as a kind of an inspiration for this, um, what might be the next generation of engineering in phototrophs, but because you are the developer community, your input and your needs are going to be very instrumental in deciding what how, so, sort of how Ginkgo approaches this problem. Uh, so that's the that's the conversation I want to start. It is what are what 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 do you the developers need in order to be able to engineer phototrophs more effectively? Uh, and how can how can Ginkgo support that process? Okay, that's my goal for the talk. Ginkgo Bioworks is something that you you probably have heard of us if you if you do iGem because we're the kind of number one iGem Stan company. Uh, we are a horizontal cell programming platform. So what that means in practice is we have a lot of human experts. We have a lot of robotics. Uh, we have a cell programming platform that is designed to do cell programming uh, at scale. 
in order to accelerate uh, and improve the processes by which we do synthetic biology. So the, our, the mission of the company is make biology easier to engineer. We were, we're we were founded in 2008. Um, our founders were uh, formerly an IGEM team. So they, our founders were the, the MIT IGEM team uh, in 2006. So IGEM is sort of, it's a part of our story. It's a part of our uh, mythology. Um, and so now, and now we're a huge company. We're based in Boston. We're publicly traded. There's hundreds of scientists working here. Um, and so I think, you know, increasingly Ginkgo is, is taking on the role of a, the, this kind of, a, you know, the, this sort of a, the, this, this, we're the flagship company of synthetic biology. Um, we're the, you know, we're the center of gravity of synthetic biology. And, uh, and I, part of that is uh, because of our mission, because of our, our work as a platform means that we sort of, we don't do, we don't do everything for ourselves, but rather we do everything for our customers, which is to say we have a lot of relationships uh, with other synthetic biology companies. And I think that's what sort of justifies thinking of us as the, as the, the, the center of, of the synthetic biology industry um, today. The world needs more biology. I don't, I don't think I have to convince you of this, but if you look at the, the biggest problems in the world are probably public health, global public health, food insecurity, uh, carbon and climate. Uh, and so plants and algae are definitely at the center of at least three of those. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe health as well. Uh, so it's very clear, I think, that there's this an urgent need to improve the way in which we do biology. But that was already true 10 years ago, and it was already true 50 years ago. Um, so the question is, what has changed? Uh, and what has changed is that unlike 10 or 50 years ago, we increasingly now, we actually do have the technology to address a lot of these, these global challenges. So it's never been a better time to be a biological developer. We can edit genomes, uh, we can design proteins, we can synthesize DNA at huge scale. Uh, anything biology makes, we can grow it 10,000 liters at a time. And so these capabilities, you know, they're, they're, they're familiar to you as iGemmers, but I think there's one more piece of tech that is, is gonna pull it all together. And what I'm talking about is foundry biotechnology, platform biotechnology. I think, it's the, I think it's not the future of synthetic biology, I think it's the present. And the implications of this for you as phototroph engineers are a very big deal because this is, it's gonna change um, not just what you can do, but also the way that you work, the way that you do your jobs. So it's not just that we can, it's the same, the same technology that we've used to engineer phototrophs, but now we can do it a little bit faster and cheaper. Uh, it actually, it reorganizes your whole mental model for what it looks like to be a phototroph. Uh, engineer. So if you are working in a lab, if you want to make a business, um, the foundry is part of this new landscape. And I think you as iGemmers at the beginning of your career, you are really in a, a good position to kind of to plan around this, this, this next generation. So you can, you can build your applications and your companies around this new reality that a lot of the cell programming in the future is gonna be, is gonna be sort of foundry uh, uh, focused, foundry powered. Okay, so what do I mean by that specifically? Put, think in your mind, imagine in your mind what it would look like, what, what would your life look like if you were to take a technology that you invented 
as an iGemmer, a phototroph engineering technology, and commercialize it if you were and launch it as a startup. Imagine in your mind, what does that look like? So historically, there's been a very classical widespread model for what an early stage biotechnology company looks like. And so this is, you could call it, you think about it as the, it's the 10 postdocs for 10 years model. Okay. So you, you raise a little bit of money, you hire some scientists, you put them in a lab where they're, where they're pipetting by hand. Uh, you pay them a lot of money because they're, they're human experts and you give them a lot of time because biology is slow to engineer. So you do that for a little while, you make some progress, you hit a technical milestone, which means that your investors give you a little bit more money, and then you keep going, you hit another technical milestone, and so on. And so after a very long time uh, in this way, you, you're able to bootstrap your, your technology into something that's functional, something that's market ready. So this is this is historically what the what the process has looked like. So now what are so the problems here? I I see. So it's not just that it's it's bad for scientists because it means you have to invest 10 years of your life in doing something that's repetitive and boring. It's bad for the bioeconomy because it means that these investments are extremely risky. Uh, and they take a very long time to pay off. So it's very hard to convince investors uh, to put money behind something like this. Um, but the, the, for me, the sort of the biggest shame about this model of biotechnology is because it's so risky, it's so expensive, it really it reduces the, the scope of what we can think about as being a commercial application of biotechnology, right? So if you're going to make, I, 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 it's, it's, you, there are, there are so many, there's so, like, it's nuts, right? There's so many possibilities in nature that we could pursue. And some of them are profitable and some of them are not going to be profitable. Um, but to the extent, but if they take 10 years and a billion dollars to try, we're not going to be able to try very many of them. So we, that's, this is why we need to really think about making this process faster and cheaper. Okay. So what are the problems, right? I think uh, it only takes a, like a few months working in a lab as an iGemmer to understand the basic scope of the problems, right? It's that uh, the experiments don't work off, often enough. The, uh, the, the, the organisms take too long to grow. Uh, everything is clear liquids in a test tube. It's very hard to characterize things. Uh, I think the 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 the, like the shape of the challenges I think are are something that you that you already uh, are familiar with, and I think it, it's something that that Ginkgo has been struggling with from the beginning. It's sort of how do how do we address these these challenges in a scalable way that isn't just sort of let's throw more human experts at it. At Ginkgo, our mission is to uh, make biology easier to engineer to solve these problems, right? To, to the extent to which they're, they're solvable um, and to the extent to which they're, they're likely to remain uh, difficult problems uh, to make them faster and cheaper, nevertheless, through the application of scale. Um, so how do we do that? We do it with our foundry. So our foundry is our is the is our automation platform. It's thinking about instead of engineering, you know, one phototroph line at a time, testing out one hypothesis for your your phototroph, think about engineering thousands of phototrophs, right? So if when you if you engineer you can doing a thousand transformations on a robotics platform is not marginally is not much slower than doing one right you because you you do them in parallel and when you when you work with automation you can test many more hypotheses you can explore a much larger design space without without adding time uh, to the project 
So this is this is the basic insight, the basic benefit of automation. The next important benefit is we call it the code base. The code base is the accumulated knowledge that you get from working in a single application space, working in a single organism over and over again. And I, this is a this is a um, advantage that I think a lot of people overlook. So if you imagine starting a phototroph engineering company, a typical phototroph engineering company will only have one application, right? Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make this one molecule, right? And we're gonna make it and then we're gonna bring it to market and then we're successful. Or we fail to make it and we dissolve the company and everybody goes home. But in either case, uh, all of the expertise that you developed in the course of, of making that project that it evaporates, it, go, it goes away into other companies. So by centralizing the work in a foundry, you can get really, really good at working with a particular organism or with a particular technology, and then you can do it over and over again. So those, those benefits extend beyond just one project to the dozens of projects that you might wanna do in one organism in the context of a foundry. Um, the other big advantage here is uh, the, the people. So it's very fun. It's very fun uh, to work at Ginkgo. So it, it, the, everything that is boring and repetitive about working at a small biotechnology startup uh, becomes much more stimulating and exciting when you do it in the context of a gigantic foundry. So the challenges of, of working in a foundry, of building an automation platform um, is it's something that is um, appealing, I think, to, 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 to many of the best scientists. Um, and so this is a kind of a win-win, right? It's a kind of a win-win. When you, when you move the, the repetitive work from individual small startups who are working by hand, to uh, the foundry context where things are running on automation, on automation, everybody's happier, right? Everybody, every, everybody gets to have uh, a, 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 a more fun job. And so this is a big advantage in terms of uh, the, the people who are actually doing the work. Okay. So this is, that's, this is the model, right? This is, this is the model behind foundry automation. The idea is that you've got the hardware which we call the foundry. You've got the software or the knowledge base that we call the code base. And these are iterating together such that the more, the more projects that we do, uh, the more we get, we benefit from the economies of scale. We benefit from the accumulated knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and this sort of synthetic biology design, build, test, and grow cycle gets, gets better every time we do it. Okay. So that's that's the foundry model. That's how the foundry works. Okay. So what what does it mean to you, right? Why does this why does this matter to you as a phototrope engineer? How is it going to make your life better, right? Doesn't this just mean oh that okay well now so oh boy Ginkgo's so great, right? They know they know everything, right? They can do everything. They have all the technology. I'm just going to retire and I'll just let Ginkgo do all the organism engineering, right? What is it, what does it mean for you? Well, so I guess so. So there, I think the important thing to remember, so we don't act like we don't, we don't do a lot of phototroph engineering, right? We don't do that yet, right? So we're not, we're not, we're not trying to, to put, put all the phototroph engineering companies out of business. That's, that's not the goal. Um, but I think it's, it's, so here you've got to remember that the, the, we, so the, the foundry is for the developers, right? So we, we, we scale all of these processes, not so that we can do them for our, to make our own products in-house. Um, we do it for the developers, for the technologies there. And so I think that the, 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 the main reason for this is that we are very good at scaling and automating cell programming processes, but we're never going to have all of the ideas for what to create, for what to engineer. Okay, so it's it needs to be you, the the developers who are working at the the ideation phase, at the inspiration phase, um, and at the product development phase, to to know what 
what to make, what 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 to automate, what what to engineer. So it really is the developers who are the kind of heroes of the story and who are the center of the uh, of the process because it's it's you who are going to bring the big ideas about what are the what are the functions that Ginkgo needs to support um, in order to make your products your technologies possible. So I want to give an example for how to think about that um, as, as, as I conclude the talk. Because if you, so if you think about it, this is, it's, it is a, it is a, there's a, 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 an intellectual challenge here. So there's a real, there's a shift in the mental model that is required when you think about how does a, how does a foundry like Ginkgo interact with developers like you. We're used to thinking of a world in which independent biotechnology companies pursue their own products, build out their own technology platforms to support it. So a world in which you are designing your products and Ginkgo is executing on your products is a very different world. It's gonna require different kinds of education, different ways of working. And of course, we can take some inspiration of this from the history of technology. So once upon a time, there were punch cards in, in technology. So punch cards were filled out manually by human users. It was a very labor uh, intensive technology and they were processed in a very centralized way so there was a there was a way for a human to interact with a machine but it was very slow it was very inefficient means of of communication right so this was this was before we had we had coding so if you like the the innovation that we need uh for ginkgo is we need to invent programming we need to invent the streamlined efficient interface where whereby you the developers can specify what you need and we the foundry can 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 implement or institute that that capability um they do this very well now in tech so in tech they have what are called software developer kits so if you develop software for windows or for mac you can download a software developer kit and it gives you tools and support and documentation and all of the information that you need in order to be able to build a particular product that is going to run on that platform okay so maybe one mental analogy here for 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 what we need is a kind of a cell developer kit so this is a this is a, a package of information that is useful to you as phototroph engineers that is going to give you the uh, a, a set of tools that let you invent in a way that works on Ginkgo's platform so that if you choose if you choose to become a, a, a Ginkgo developer you can do it in a very efficient way your technology is ready to to scale uh at a foundry so that's that's one uh possible model for this so we have been uh working to implement these uh i'll skip this for the sake of of brevity but we so we have one of these in process it is for uh it is for protein expression uh in in a pikia host so there we're we're working on a cell developer kit that will support any biotechnology company if you want to produce a protein in a pikia host we can standardize that project we can implement it on the foundry um, much more efficiently it doesn't require uh, a lot of punch card editing a lot of manual face-to-face -face conversations in order to make a project like that work um so my challenge then to the phototroph community is what does a cell development kit look like for 
phototropes. What do, what do you need as phototroph engineers? What are the organisms that you want to work with? Um, what, are the, what are the applications? What are the technologies? Uh, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of gene editing technologies uh, need to be, be developed? What kind of protein expression or metabolic engineering technologies um, that you need? Because your generation, uh, I think you are going to be, you're going to be foundry native cell, cell developers. So you're not going to be doing everything by hand in, in pipetting. Uh, you're going to be thinking about a foundry like Ginkgo's foundry as a tool in your, in your workflow, in your development pipeline, just like you think about all the other tools in your lab. And there's going to be There'll be a time in your phototroph engineering project where you say, okay, I've, I've taken this idea as far as I can in our small startup lab. We're going to onboard it to the foundry. We're going to transform it to the foundry um, to bring that functionality up to the next level. Okay, so that's my, that's my sales pitch. Um, and uh, I am interested in uh, starting a conversation with this community. And I want to hear... Uh, what do you think about ginkgo? What do you think about the future of synthetic biology? Um, and uh, how can we how can we make phototroph engineering uh, easier? Thank you very much, Jake. That was amazing. <laughs> so yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to come in or in the, um, the mirror. I, I've seen that the mirror is quite active right now, so I'm gonna go there for a bit. Okay, let me, I'm not sure if, let me see if I can get on the Miro. Uh, sure. Some here, I can start. So one of the first questions that we actually had is, how did you get into the role like a development evangelist? Like what was your career trajectory and to be in such a role like this? Yeah, it's, I think, so it's a bit of a, it is a, it's a funny title. I like, I, I know, I, I, which I'm, you know, I'm a funny guy. So I like, I like having a funny title, but it's, um, it, it's a real job in tech. It's a real job in, in software. So if you go to, if you go to a software develop, developer conference, uh, there will be people with the title developer evangelist who come from technology platform companies that, that help people get on the platform. So that's 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 the analogy behind behind the role. Now, of course, it's it's going to work very different in in biology. So we're sort of figuring it out as as we go. Um, but that's that's the where we're starting. Um, my background: I was a I was an academic. I have a I have a PhD in systems biology. Um, I was I did a lot of iGEM. I was I did a, I mentored a lot of iGEM teams. Um, I have a lot of I have a lot of love for iGEM. Uh, because of the kind of the sense of whimsy and just the just the diversity of projects that you see in iGEM. So I'm I've always believed that we could be doing more with biology than we are. Um, and I think and iGEM is sort of leads the way in terms of just just dreaming expansively about these these possibilities, what we could do if we just we just if we could just unlock the may if we just make biology just a little bit easier to engineer a lot of iGEM projects could be could be brought to life um I also I so I did a lot of science communication I did I I had a YouTube channel um so I, I think that that has helped prepare me for this role because it's there's a lot of communication um as part of it so there, that's that's my background It's amazing. More questions here. So um, this one says, are cell-free systems as a, a prototyping platform already part of the Ginkgo trials to scale up the speed of development? Yes, we do. We, we, have, we have some work. Um, we have some work on, on cell-free. Yes. Here. So what does this engineering process look like? What is the product that Ginkgo provides once the DBTG is over? So we 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 like to say that the organism is the is the product. 
the or so in a, a typical um for for a, for a typical project what we'll what we deliver is an engineered organism that that makes a particular product um and then what you you could call it a, a technology transfer package so um we could so we'll the, the optimize the the fermentation conditions uh sort of everything you need to know in order to be able to make a product using this organism at a at a at a factory scale Another question we have is how can Ginkgo so easily automate experiments proposed by developer where each experiment has so many specifics to it outside of the CDKs? Um, do, do a lot of new robotics need to be built for each project? Yes. So the so the answer there is um, I think it, it's a very good question. And so it is. Let's see. Boy, how do I even answer that? Uh, yes, it is very so it is very hard. It is very hard to to automate uh, biology. There is a lot about biology that is that is bespoke, that is unique to each to an individual project. Um, but there's also a lot of biology that is that is not bespoke, that is that is is not unique. Um, so we you, we you, we think about this challenge as a, you can think about it as a, a, sort of a horizontal integration challenge. You you want to you take the space of everything that is possible in engineering biology. Then you you want to you divide it up into functions that can cover as much of that space uh, as possible. Um, and so, of course, naturally, you want to begin by automating the functions that have the widest use that can that cover the widest number of applications. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, as as we think about engineering phototrophs, I, one one way to um, to sort of approach this problem as a, as the developer community is what like what are what are those functions right what are what are the automated processes that you would be that you wish you could do uh, in a phototroph that would unlock not just not just one application but this, the a, the widest number of possible uh, applications right so you want to you want to get the most benefit. Uh, from the least amount of work in in developing each automation uh, process. Um, perhaps uh, there's also one in the chat, but like I, I would like to jump in in between um, and ask a question directly. It's more of a human practice um, <laughs> uh, perspective on this, um, but as a citizen of the European Union, um, we always have the great uh, thing that basically nothing is allowed in that regard uh, of uh, uh, synthetic biology. Um, and so, so I wondered in regards of foundries and these kind of systems, Especially considering, um, like an international, like um, if I want to make something happen uh, and and have like my own setup of ideas, I have tested my stuff, and now I want to like send it uh, or have it made in a biofoundry or or rather like um, be improved, etc. Like, do you think that uh, the EU legislations, the restrictions, et cetera, et cetera, um, will actually play a big role in the regards of biofoundries as well? Or do you think it will be rather just a question of a few years or whatsoever until it's like actually breaking through and uh, will be available also for European citizens? Um. Well, so it's you. It's it's not the um, 
it's not the it's not the use of the foundry per se which is which is restricted right like it, there's not a there there's not an issue with taking a, a technology that was developed in Europe and and transferring it um in in into the foundry for um for for development right it's it's the um it's it's the market it's the the market that that uh poses the the biggest uncertainty and the and the and the biggest risk so of course you're like europe europe is a huge market um if you can't sell your product uh in europe it's you know it's 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 that's a, that's a lot of money that you're leaving on the table it's going to it makes it that much harder um to convince an investor uh to support the development of a product uh like that um I, that's a, of course it's a very difficult question. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I think it's a long-term project. Um, I think it is. It's a it's a it's a question of developing trust, um, of showing that we the we the synthetic biologists uh, care about the public interest, uh, that we can in implement transparency um around uh what we do um and that we care about what we do um and i think it's 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 a sort of a long-term project but i think igem is is has been really um sort of in, uh influential in that uh in in developing that sort of culture of care uh and i think that uh i mean i, I think i think that we're going to get there right i think i think that if we were sort if we sort of hit the reset button today and we were having a new conversation about about GMOs with with the public, and iGEM was the example of how GMO development processes worked. I think people would love that. I think I think people would be very receptive to it. I think they would see it as a as a sort of high trust space, a place with very good values, um, a place with rigorous uh, safety safety controls. Um, so I think that in that sense, I think we're, we're like, we're on the right track. Um, and if we can sort of keep uh, being worthy of trust, uh, then then we will eventually win people's trust. It looks like we have one more question in the Zoom. Um, which says, I'm wondering if synthetic biology at this level and its accelerating progress may cause more damage to the planet than benefit. What is Ginkgo, what is the Ginkgo philosophy about this potential threat? Yeah, so I mean, it, so the, the question is, you have to care, right? You have to, you have to care how your platform is used. Um, I think that we've seen in recent years, we've seen a lot of technology platforms that that had uh, that had the public trust, social media platforms, for example, um, that people people saw them as being sort of fun or harmless or uh, you know acting more or less in the public interest, and they they squandered a lot of that trust because uh, because they didn't care enough, and so now people have there's a lot of mistrust for these um, for these companies as institutions, um, and so the kind of so yes, so this is this the short answer is you have to you have to care about how your platform is being used. You have to think about uh, uh, so not not just uh, obeying the laws and and the regulations, right? Of because uh, uh, of course every big biotechnology company has to uh, has to do that, but you have to you have to sort of think ahead about what are the right what are the what are the government governance structures? What are the policies and practices? What are the what is the culture that you need to build uh, in order to care about how your platform is being used to to make the right decisions about what kind of projects uh, that you work on? And so I think if you're interested in in how um, how Ginkgo is 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 thinking about those uh, those challenges, you can go to the um, where I work, which is called the Sociotech Studio. Uh, I think it's ginkgo.studio. Uh, or you can also uh, you can also read uh, Grow Magazine. So if you if you Google Grow by Ginkgo, 
uh, you can get a copy of, of Grow Magazine, where we're, we have this, this ongoing conversation about how do we use uh, synthetic biology responsibly, and how do we, like, how do we operationally implement that in the way that ginkgo works, not, like, not just talk about it. I think there's also another in the mirror. Um, so we know that you talked about um, standardization, how Ginkgo's trying to approach that already in your talk, but there seems to be a movement in synthetic biology about standardization. For example, at least for one of the phototrophs that's like a big like chassis in the iGEM competition, which is Plamy Demonis Brain Hardii, there is like a MoClo kit available, um, which seems which aims to like standardize engineering um, um, and create like a standard that's like adhered to between like many researchers, which makes like swapping of parts easier. So I'm wondering if you think like the more widespread adoption of these efforts will sort of help Ginkgo like indirectly in their efforts to sort of standardize these processes. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a good question. I think it's a it's an open question of like what what so it's it's clear that we like that the use of standards makes communication more efficient in an industry, right? Like that's obvious. We, that's history proves that, right? So we need them in we need them in biotech too. They are going to be the future of biotech. We are we are going to have more standards around the way that we work together. Uh, that's obvious. What is not so obvious is what are, what well, like what are what what are they, right? And I think in the the sort of first generation of synthetic biology, there was significant emphasis on the me the mechanics of DNA assembly as the point of standardization, and this is this is the tradition that MoClo comes from. So the idea was that we should all we should all kind of use the same enzymes, use the same junction sequences, so that my parts library and your parts library can be assembled together. And I think that made a lot of sense in the era in which DNA synthesis was still pretty expensive, and and cloning and assembling DNA was the biggest challenge and the the biggest bottleneck. Uh, for designing new kinds of biology. <coughs> um, but I don't know, I don't know that the future looks like that. I don't know that the future looks like that. I think that we're, we're pretty quickly moving into the era where DNA synthesis is going to be so widespread, and it's going to be so cheap that I don't really need your, I don't need your DNA library to interact with my DNA library, because I'm just, I'm just going to synthesize everything I need. Um, and so if it isn't that, then what is it? Um, I don't know, right? Is it, so is it, is it the way that we encode our data? Is it the organisms that we work with? Uh, is it the software platforms that we use uh, to design? Um, I think, it, I think, it, I think it's an open question of what, what is, what, what is the nature of the next generation of SynBio standards? Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna have to move on a bit more because of terms of time. Again, thank you very much for everything, Jake. That was amazing. <laughs> really nice, thanks. Um, thanks everybody. <laughs> thank you. Um, remember that you can send more questions to our Miro. We are gonna have a couple of spaces throughout this um, conference to keep the conversation going. <laughs> Hashtag wood gang. And um, without further ado, we'll continue with the next, our next presenter. So. Um, here to discuss her recent experience as a lab and social media intern at Spira Inc., we have Hannah Press, who is currently attending the California State University as an undergrad student studying health, communication, and biology. So without further ado, the stage is yours. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I guess, I don't know if I can share my screen. I should be able to. Sorry, give me one second. 
Um, I don't know why it's not letting me share my screen right now. I'm sorry, what was that? Screen sharing should be enabled for everyone. It says it's failed to start. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't really know what's happening. Maybe try rejoining the Zoom meeting briefly for the like, okay. Yeah, I'll try that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> While we wait, again, uh, please feel free to share your comments, questions in the mirror board, also in the Zoom chat. We have people joining us um, in uh, in Discord as well. So just as a reminder that we it's kind of a space for all of you to discuss and talk. So yeah. Could you perhaps, uh, for our Discord users, give us a brief introduction to what uh, the Photoshop community is actually about? Uh, like how it came to be last year and uh, what you are trying to do this year? Just a brief one and we don't want to like intersect with uh, uh, the next speaker, but yeah. <laughs> sure, that's perfect. So as a recap, what we're trying to do with this community is to bring back together um, a community of not only iGemmers, but of researchers from all different areas so that they can share these projects and different things. So our goal this year is to try to bring more interaction between the community, trying to bring more projects on the board. We are trying to expand the, the, the book that was created before, trying to make some videos protocols, trying to get some standards across our community, and in general, trying to, to get more people enthusiastic and passionate about working with these organisms so that they are not afraid of trying this really cool, um, this really cool science. Okay, Hannah, I saw her come back please. So I don't know if she's still here. Are you able to share your screen, Hannah? I, I saw her for a, for a bit. All right, it should hopefully work now. So sorry about that. Oh. All right, here we go. You guys see my screen now? Yep. Okay, awesome. All right, let me just go to my drive. Sorry, I had to restart my computer and okay. So now here we are. All right, so hello, once again, uh, my name is Hannah Press. Um, this past summer, I worked at Spirit Inc as a laboratory intern, as well as a social media and health communications intern. And uh, Bioscience LA essentially is the program in which I got this, I was able to get this internship through. So a little bit about me, um, I, like everyone said before, um, I am a health communication and biology major at a California State University, Channel Islands. And um, one of the main things that really inspired me to get into STEM uh, was that my grandfather was an aerospace and metallurgic engineer and he worked at Alcoa and had a really uh, big influence on the world of metallurgic engineering. I uh, created multiple aluminum alloys that are still used in planes today. And just having that 
I guess, scientific background in my family always just made me really curious and asked a bunch of questions always. But how I really got into biology more specifically was that uh, he actually gifted me a microscope for my 10th birthday. And I would always look at things between like carrot, like a little droplet of water from like a carrot or apple skins or dirt underneath that microscope. And I was just always really interested in the world around me. And yeah, so some hobbies I have have are um, I play a plethora of different instruments but mostly uh, cello and guitar I do love drinking boba um, I work out and love being outside and I also love playing with animals so yeah all right so let's start into Spira now Spira is a company that produces products and services that are basically geared towards helping human and planetary health uh, the main uh, product that they focus on is spirulina. So these two pictures here are uh, spirulina pigments. So basically they extract different proteins from the spirulina microalgae and they can be this really bright blue color or this green color here. There's also a couple other colors that are in development and being worked on now, but they are not made from spirulina. Uh, yeah, so these colors can be used in honestly everything, and the main purpose of them is to be replacing petroleum-based dyes and other products. So yeah, they're completely edible, uh, safe for cosmetics, textile dyes, and spirulina is also really good at extracting harsh metals from water, and is also a really safe uh, thing to replace food with, so it helps a lot with uh, places that experience food insecurity and stuff like that. So uh, basically, um, Spira has three main departments, DNA, farming, and refining. So the main part that I worked in was the DNA sector as and just working in the lab directly on uh, bacterial transformations with spirulina. So using agrobacterium and inserting genes into spirulina using plasmids uh, to give them certain antibiotic resistance. So yeah, like I just said, this was most of the, the most of the work I did was uh, through the lab. And since I also am uh, working on health communications uh, for my degree, uh, I had the opportunity to work, I guess, with R&D communications uh, via taking my experiences in the lab and certain things that we were working on and able to talk about them on social media. So a lot of my time in the lab was also spent filming and recording and writing down. So this is gonna be just a quick little snapshot of a lot of the different types of experiments that we ran. This is directly from um, my lab notebook. So uh, a lot of the things that I would do was just take notes because I had never experienced uh, a, a biology lab, a microbiology lab before because when I was taking my lower division biology credits, uh, it was the COVID shutdown. So everything was completely online. And this was my first time really being immersed in a place like that. So I wrote everything down and just try to learn as much as I can. So this was a uh, plasmid characteristics when we were working with uh, multiple different types of plasmids, trying to insert certain genes into spirulina to see which plasmids would be the most effective at that, the different solutions that we used. And yeah, so here's a little bit more in depth um, into exactly what that takes and the exact like organization of data that you have to really do to, to make that work for you. Um, so honestly, it was super helpful to have this to reference, even though it's a little, it seems a little bit messy and chaotic. Uh, there would be certain days that I would not be able to come into the lab and having this just available for anyone to reference uh, that was doing work in the lab was extremely helpful. So here on this left side here is gonna be one of the PCR uh, experiments that we ran. And this was the work for that on the side using electrophoresis. So essentially uh, one part of my internship that I was like completely new to was genetic engineering. Um, thankfully, like Elliot and Ryan were super willing to help me experiment and like learn different new ways to like be in biology. And one software that I used was Genius Prime and I got a up close look at all the different plasmids that I just talked about before, exactly their sequences, where they line up on the left and right homology arms. And 
Yeah, pretty much. So just going through all that, all the measurements and all the data and um, writing out like all the procedures for a Gibson assembly and uh, the electrophoresis as well and what ended up happening for them. So this is also a continuation of the electrophoresis experiment that we were running. Um, I, I lined it all up in a table and I did like all this math and all and we uh, collected all this data just to make sure that we were still doing everything correctly. Um, when we were working on the quantification, I like to be super understanding of exactly what we're working on because this was all extremely new to me. And like I said before, I had never been in a microbiology lab before. So I this keeps this helps me keep my thoughts organized. And if you guys saw the way that Ryan organizes his data, you would understand that this can be really helpful for someone who's more new to that area when it comes to just organization in, in general. And even just like every single thing that I could write down, I would like all these drawings on the bottom are the different plasmids and exactly which segments of them and the order that have the certain traits. So between like YFP and the strep antibiotic resistance and the way that that was ordered and basically explaining why to me. So then on the right, uh, these are more procedures and just like different things that we added to them. Um, I had some lab work done as well, just like mostly refilling and making like refilling cultures and making SOT in order for the spirulina and agrobacterium to thrive together better. And yeah. So that was most of the lab work that I had been working on. Um, these couple of links right here are some of the social media posts that I worked on for Spira. Um, a lot of, it's like some of the content I did was filmed at home. So I believe the second one um, is a reel that I did. It's making Rice Krispies with the electric sky pigment. And this can be found on their Instagram right now. So yeah, and I'd say that was like probably one of my favorite things to work on. And then also this video as well. This is a lab ASMR video. So yeah, basically just um, always trying to find different ways and ideas to try to connect um, regular people to science and just taking like com combining social media trends and maybe not as technical things going on in the lab that we can't talk about with social media. I'd say that um, working in science communications, that's probably one of the biggest challenges is revealing like just enough information and this first post right here was an example of how we did that. So this is a picture that I took actually of spirulina, um, healthy spirulina, if you can see it's clustered together, really, really green and super squiggly. In simpler terms, that's basically how to know that it's healthy. And so we basically wrote up uh, a bunch of captions just about what we were doing, but not by revealing too much. So this is also could be found on their Instagram. and. Yeah, I'd say, especially in the biotech community, um, what you can talk about and say online is really uh, rough because there's a line that's extremely there and crossing that line is a lot easier than people like to think because it's really, like people always wanna talk about the things that they're working on and things they're doing and what excites them about that. But unfortunately, we can't always just be super straightforward because of the, the privacy about that as well. So basically throughout working on, uh, for Spira, I acquired quite a few skills, including microbiology lab skills, all anything that entails microbiology lab in general. Um, I had never touched a pipette before. Um, I'd only cultured cells like on agroplates, not in liquid, which was very, very new and different to me. And they're very temperamental. And I learned that a couple hard ways. Um, just understanding different lab equipments. Like I'd never used a centrifuge or even like a shaker incubator. And those are probably our two best friends in the lab because spirulina grows a lot better in a shaker incubator that's around 33, 
uh, degree Celsius and just uh, using different microscopes and lab safety skills. Uh, also, a lot of our work involved just going through papers and that was something that I had never really experienced before and as in depth that our entire work was based off of like the research of a, a bunch of different papers and we kind of took what we saw as valuable from all those papers and combined it and was able to do our work. So these skills were really important to me because as someone who is doing science communication, you can't communicate science if you don't know how and where the, the research even comes from. So being in a lab environment like that just provides a facility for me to be able to fully understand like everything that goes into production and research. And once, at least for me, like once you have a full understanding, you can so much easily, like more easily communicate that to people in a way that everyone will understand. And so the bottom here are just a couple of pictures. Um, this in the left-hand corner is once is another healthy cluster spirulina. I just think it looks super cool under a microscope. And this was the first time that I was able to get it in the dark field. So I felt really proud of myself for, for being able to do that. Um, this is me holding a pipette because I was like, oh my gosh, science, yay. So that's that was that. And then this was a successful cell packing experiment that uh, Ryan and I were able to run together. If you can see um, how dark green all of the, this little area is right here. That's gonna be uh, spirulina cells like super compact and sticking to silica gel. So essentially we we washed them, flushed them, uh, just made, like ran them through with uh, silica gel and kind of found this like very obscure protocol, tweaked it a little bit to better fit what we wanted it for. And yeah, it ended up really successful, which was pretty awesome. And just more content creation. This was my first time. Uh, making gel and actually running gel, gel electrophoresis. So this was our machine. And then this picture on the right with the orange is a, a broken, unhealthy, dead spirulina. I call it the zombie because there are so many different spirulina <laughs> particles floating around it. And this one's just like the biggest in chunks. So it's like, oh, well, why were you the only one? And that was able to stay like that. So yeah, that was just pretty cool to me at least, but. And, okay. It's all right. So my future plans, um, I will not be graduating college until May of 2024. So I will be continuing with my education. Um, I hope to go into R&D communications and like the corporate communication sector for a biotechnology company um, post-college. And like I was saying before, uh, working in the lab has helped me gain a better understanding of scientific processes and how to communicate them because health communication is basically is the science and art of just using communication to advance everyone's knowledge of different scientific processes and what goes into them. So if anyone has any questions, don't mind my meme. I hope you like it. <laughs> so as someone who works in a lab, how do you like, I guess, how do you work around collaborative like differences and ideas? And what do you do to kind of make sure that you can still pursue this the things that you you need to do and kind of um I guess what's the word um compromise in that aspect right um I honestly would say that I was fortunate enough to work with someone who cared as much about the research as they did about my lab growth that's kind of the point of these internships and the people that want interns for them tend to have that attitude uh yeah, so it was really positive and in the end it was like as much of a learning experience for me as it was for Ryan because Ryan, by the way, is uh, the person that I worked under. Ryan George is, uh, the, yeah, basically the person at Spear that I uh, did my research alongside and worked for. So yeah, honestly, I didn't really experience any like collaborative differences um we were both super willing to listen to each other and keep an open mind and it was also really helpful to have the numerous papers to reference and honestly like we just worked together to create protocols it was never really like 
one a one sided thing, and that we would, I guess, argue about like different better ways to do things because we could always try it and see. Because there's two of us, so if one of us had one idea and one of us had another, and we weren't sure which one would be better, we would just try it all and see what worked best, and let that, I guess, guide our work. Can I jump in with a question? Of course. Uh, okay. If you could change one thing about the way the biotech industry communicates with the public, mm -hmm. what would you change? Um, honestly, because research and a lot of different uh, inter internal things about like biotech communities are not really able to be talked about. It does make it a little bit harder to get the public to trust you and your research and what you're representing. So I think that if there's a, a way to better connect uh, a larger audience with your message and your company's message, I mean, everyone is affected by, by climate change, for example, right? And switching from petroleum to algae-based products helps combat that and helps human humans and the planet all at the same time. However, that message doesn't necessarily resonate with everyone. So you want to cater the certain things that you're saying on online or in media and press releases to fit the largest audience that you possibly can. And it's it's just honestly like really, really complicated because you're like, wow, well, obviously not everyone's going to have the same belief. Obviously, I'm going to be catering to different demographics. But with the rise of social media, your demographic becomes everyone, right? Especially with TikTok, like how the For You page works is that it can be on anyone's page. So it's just about getting your message out in a way that it's clear and concise, but also gets people's attention. And that has been really challenging for certain companies to do. Like I'll even go ahead and start roasting. Amgen tried to make a TikTok account and they it, their first video was atrocious, frankly. It was very, very bad. And uh, they used an uh, Erlenmeyer flask and called it a beaker. They had like a lot of other different scientific errors and everyone in the comments, it like it literally went viral for the fact that there was a lot of things wrong with it. So they deleted their entire account. So just having people that are in charge of expressing messages like that is really, really important, especially for like one of the biggest biotech companies in the world. So. That's a great, yeah. Thanks, thanks, very cool. Yeah. Okay, we do have some questions in the mirror as well that I'll read out. One of them is, um, what were the biggest challenges you faced when starting in a lab for the first time? And what advice would you give to new researchers who want to become involved in genetic engineering? Okay, um, I would say that the, my first week was really, really overwhelming. And I even told uh, the SPEAR team I had no idea what was going on. So taking notes and honestly, even just reviewing them at home, like even if you don't really know what's going on, just writing down everything and doing your own independent research that maybe could be that you could find like at a level that's a little bit more easy for you to understand and just be willing to uh, uh, put yourself in a, in a situation that like you never expected to be in intellectually and that will help you grow so because of that. And I'd say my advice uh, would be to push yourself. If, even if you feel like it's a, a very out of reach for you um it's honestly so much more worth it in the end because of the people that you meet the experiences that you get and everyone is very very willing to help I feel like people are scared to not be the best and to not be the smartest in the room but if you're around the right people they will help you grow so and we have another one which is a little bit related which is how did you gain the knowledge you needed to begin thinking about genetic engineering and working in the lab? Um, so basically how it, I guess that all got started was we were sitting down together and Elliot and Ryan were like, oh, you should check out Genius Prime. And I was like, what is that? And uh, they sent me all the different files that they had on the different plasmids. And we kind of just played around on it together for an hour. 
or so they they gave me like a little bit of tutorials and showed me how to look at things and how to switch things around and why things were orchestrated the way they were so honestly it was just a big tutorial day but like I said before they are so willing to help this new generation of scientists uh, coming into research and that was honestly what made the the biggest difference for me was that like they trusted me to bring like my knowledge and my expertise whether I had it or not to the table but I also was extremely willing to learn from them so I think if you have a, a symbiotic relationship with that like that with with uh, the people that you're working with especially if your entire purpose of being with them is to learn from them it is super beneficial If anyone has any questions, don't think, but otherwise, I don't see any more. There was one question, and Miro is quite open. He was asking, like, why spirulina? Okay, <laughs> that's that's a good question. So, <laughs> because it's a microalgae, and it also, Yes, it's a microalgae and it's very easy to, I guess, come by. Um, it has a lot of different health benefits. It's still fairly new to the phototroph community. Uh, there's all different types of research being run on it between its properties and helping with cancer and even HIV. There's currently a bunch of different studies going on about that to petroleum uh, switching. So basically there's like a huge, huge market for products like that because you have like fossil fuels and you have pharmaceuticals and you have everything in between with that right so spirulina you can basically genetically engineer it and any way you want to fit any of those any of that uh that space really so I guess spear is still figuring out different ways to to fill those gaps and the planet and humans as a whole. So it was also, I will say, like super inspiring to be around people that actually cared about that because a lot of companies will just be like, we want to help people. And then you are like, okay, cool. How? And do you actually want to? So being around scientists that actually cared about what they were doing and that that was like their main mission and main directive, I'd say it was also a, a very inspiring experience. And also the fact that everyone was like fairly young, like not that much older than me. It was, it was crazy to, to see that firsthand and to be immersed in that. Cool, thank you very much. So yeah, thanks Hannah for everything. We're gonna go. All right, thank you so much. Thanks to you. For having me, appreciate it. That's really nice. So um, we're gonna jump now to a bio break. So we're gonna have about 15 minutes so that you can just go relax a bit. We had some really nice talks in the, this morning. Uh, please also feel free to stay around, ask questions, you can even talk around and we'll meet up in 15 minutes. Hope you're enjoying the conference. All right, for our only users here, uh, yes, all right. Um, yeah, uh, there's just a little break. There will be, I think, a few more talks. Uh, yeah, um, from the from Martin Koch and René Inkemann afterwards, and then I think also from uh, some item teams in general. Um, so I think in... 15 minutes, like 10 past, uh, whatever time time zone you're in, 10 past, <laughs> uh, and then it should continue. Um, I know René Inkemann myself, he's a very, very smart dude, so you can definitely be um, hyped for him. I don't know the other people, but 
at least René is a very smart uh, person. <laughs>
So now we're back. Hope everyone's getting back into the live. Yeah, we have everyone here again. Cool. So we can proceed with our next round of speakers. So we can share the screen. Thank you, welcome back. Um, so we're just gonna head back straight into our lineup of speakers and we'll now hear from Dr. Maurice Koch who will be giving his talk asynchronously today. Um, Dr. Koch is currently a, a lab team lead at BASF, Germany's largest chemical company. He is also an alum of the University of Tübingen where he studied cyanobacteria for the production of sustainable and biodegradable bioplastics, which is what we'll be hearing about today. Yeah, by the way, uh, the audio problem is not on our side. It's, uh, I think, something they messed up in the stream. Where it takes I it. The ah, there it is. <laughs> I hope you can hear and see me okay. And um, I'm happy that I can now give you a quick um, well, overview of some of the scientific work which I've done for the last couple of years throughout my PhD and also throughout my postdoc. Um, I worked mostly with cyanobacteria, um, which I think, is, if I understood correctly, is also something you guys are interested in. Um, so hopefully uh, the next 30 minutes will be an, an interesting time for you. Mm -hmm. I'll just share my screen now so that you can also have some content, not just my face, for the next 30 minutes. Uh, so what I will tell you about is um, how I investigated the specific metabolism of PHB biosynthesis in the model strains Leucocystis, uh, SPP, SPPCC603, the standard classical model strain, and um, how I went from basic research to also some applications in the end. Um, this entire work happened at the University of Tübingen, which is a small university in the southwest. Uh, potentially, it's the most beautiful city in the entire Germany. If you ever happen to be there, make sure to stop by. And uh, it was funded by the Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes, which is um, just some kind of scholarship that they generally still funded me. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I would like to start by just um, sharing some of my uh, vacation photos with you. Because before I started my PhD and before I was sure about what I wanted to do my research on, I um, was studying abroad for a semester at um, the IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai. And um, so I thought I'd bring you a couple of pictures from that time. So here you see me on one of those uh, holy festivals where people throw color each other. And I'm standing next to one of those holy cows. And um, here you can see some more of those holy cows just eating some trash. And there's another cow just sitting in a pile of trash. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm showing you, I'm sharing these pictures with you is because when I was in India, I also experienced how, um, well, problematic our usage of plastic is if you don't have proper recycling. And I guess in many countries of the global south, it's, it's very um, obvious. So um, I back then decided that I wanted to use my skills and my knowledge in biotechnology to potentially and do something about this. And um, this is not just a problem in India, but all over the world. So on this graph, you can see the global um, production scale of plastic. You can see that 
annually we produce up to 400 million tons, a million metric tons, which is a huge amount of, of, of plastic. Um, and, uh, and in fact, it's it's more than the um, the weight of the entire human population combined, um, which we're producing every year. And um, the, the fun fact about this is that um, the biggest chunk of it, which makes up more than 40 percent, actually used for um, for packaging. And this is especially ironic because um, packaging is something we usually need just for a few maybe um, yeah minutes or hours sometimes days but not very much longer and nevertheless this material we're using here is very durable um yeah so um this um, might might be a little mismatch there um and i think the situation we're in is already quite dramatic um if i could give you just one number i would probably read the following one to illustrate this um a recent study has shown that by the year 2050 there are probably more there was going to be more plastic in the ocean than there's fish by weight so we're really talking about a huge environmental problem here and uh, clearly we have to do something about it so um now theoretically you could say maybe we should just change our behavior but if you could just go to like uh, any kind of supermarket you can see that we humans have a tendency to wrap pretty much everything in plastic even if it is something like a banana, which comes in its own packaging, or even things like cocoa, uh, coconuts, and in more bizarre cases, even things like Coca-Cola cans can be wrapped in plastic. So apparently, just relying on human intelligence and uh, behavioral change might not be sufficient. So maybe um, we could come up with like some technological innovations and uh, solutions for this, um, because. I guess at the end of the day, it is the dilemma, right? It's, I mean, those are examples for unnecessary packaging, but in many other situations, plastic can be a very um, well practical um, thing to have. Um, but how can we solve this dilemma between practicality and the ecological damage at the same time? Um, Theoretically, bioplastics could be a solution. Um, unfortunately, um, many of them are not as biodegradable as they claim to be. In this study, for example, uh, the researchers from uh, a British university have bought two compostable um, bioplastic bags. And in the left picture, they have um, just dumped it in the, in the ocean, left it there for three years. And on the right picture, they have buried it underground uh, in the soil, left it there for three years. And as you can see, even after this time, the researchers were still able to carry their shoppings back home. So um, clearly, uh, what's currently in the market and being sold as bioplastic is not, um, yeah, it's not having the right properties. It's not sufficiently biodegradable. Um, and uh, that's where I came into play uh, because I thought maybe. Bacteria, and I'm a microbiologist by training, could help us um, solve this problem. Um, and for this, um, I guess for you as a nerdy community, I don't need to introduce uh, pseudocystins very much. Um, and probably also not that this model strain is capable of um, growing with the help of photosynthesis. Um, but beyond that, pseudocystins also has a, another very neat um, capability, which is only becomes evident when you take a closer look. So this is an electron microscopic picture of silicosystems. That's how it looks like in a happy vital state. Um, and for this uh, condition, it requires nitrogen. And if you take away a nitrogen source, um, they actually transform the process we refer to as chlorosis. So I guess that on these two pictures, you can already see that the, the cells look quite different. For example, here, the telocrit membranes, which are usually like uh, at the interior of the cell, are completely degraded. You can also see that the intracellular structure looks quite different. For example, you have these big white granules inside. And th those white granules consist of material called PHB. So long story short, what I wanted to do in my uh, PhD was to use cyanobacterial cells to, um, to use the energy provided by the sun and then they should also like actively absorb CO2 from the atmosphere to do something against climate change. The only thing which is uh, missing is that I take away certain nutrition, like for example nitrogen, 
and this triggers the accumulation of this biopolymer PHB, which stands for polyhydroxybutyrate, uh, in the cells. And the reason why I'm so excited about this, you might have already guessed it, is that PHB is actually a new form of easily biodegradable bioplastic, much better than or currently available um, materials on the market. Um, and since it's um, also carbon neutral, it would also be good for the climate. Um, so it's a pretty good material, but there's one downside, which is that naturally, um, silicon cysts produce only very small amounts of it. So approximately 10% of the cells uh, is made out of PHB. So the main goal of my doctoral work was to better understand um, the PHB metabolism in the cells. And uh, once I would be able to understand it, I would potentially also be able to optimize it. Um, and um, um, now I would like to share some of the results of my PhD work with you. So I've subdivided it into four different projects. The first one is about the physiology. So what are the environmental conditions? What are the conditions which are affecting the PHB metabolism? Second one is about um, regulators. So proteins and enzymes which are somehow involved in this process. Third one is about the general metabolism. So how is the carbon uh, flux going through the cell? And then finally, um, metabolic engineering approaches where I try to genetically optimize the cells so that they accumulate more of our valuable bioplastic. We'll start with the physiology part first. Um, and just, um, right, and one of the phenomena I've observed there was that um, the PHP granules are unevenly distributed among the cells. So for example, I brought you another electron microscopy picture here. And where I try to um, capture um, cells which are like very differently um, filled with, with PHP. And you can see that some of the cells have like several PHP granules, while other cells have only very small and very few granules. And um, what I was able to show in this work was that um, those differences are not based on any genetic differences. So um, they are all genetically identical, um, they're clones from each other. And nevertheless, they show this diversity of PHP content. Until today, it's not known why this is the case and how they're regulating this. Um, but um, the, the experiment, how I, how I proved this was basically that I separated the low producer from the, uh, the low producers from the high producers, and then um, basically grew them for like another iteration of this experiment. And then it turned out that even the daughter generation, like their offspring essentially, also had this um, diverse uh, pattern. Um, so it's obviously or apparently not um, based on any genetic differences, but on some environmental issues. And the next part will be about regulators. So for example, proteins which are involved there. And in order for you to better understand what I mean, I just would like to give you a rough schematic overview of um, how a PHP granule looks like. So here in the middle, you have the, the so-called PHP core, which is essentially just like the elongated um, PHP polymer. And this is surrounded by a set of various different proteins and enzymes. So some of them are, for example, the polymerases, which elongate the carbon uh, polymer. Some of them are regulatory proteins. And then you're shown as these red dots. They are also um, so-called phasins. And those are well, um, proteins which are um, located on the surface to basically shield the hydrophobic polymer from the rest of the cytoplasm. And um, what I've done in um, another project was that I identified a new protein which was putatively a phase in. And in order to test if this is really the case, I created um, uh, a knockout strains of this phase in. And then I tested how this affected the numbers of granules per cell. So this is um, a fluorescence microscopic picture. And you can see that the wild type cell usually under these conditions have like two to three granules per cell. Um, here shown as this uh, fluorescent um, dots with, with no white cells. 
And when we then looked out our newly identified phasin, um, I could show that uh, the number of granules was drastically increased. So apparently, um, this, this gene SLR058 does indeed encode for a protein, which is uh, regulating the amount of granules within the cell. Unfortunately, though, although it looks different maybe on this picture, um, the overall amount of PHB was not increased. It was just that the granules were um, yeah, differently distributed, or the amount was uh, distributed on more granules. Next up is um, I investigated the general metabolism. So what I was interested here in was how the carbon is floating or like flowing through the cell. And for this, I also brought you a schematic overview. So this is our chlorotic silicosystem cell. And um, I've highlighted here the most important carbon pathways. So CO2 is fixed in the cell, and then it has basically three different routes, the EMP pathway, which is the classic glycolysis, and the neutral pathway, or oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. And from there, it's further converted to um, acetyl-CoA from where PHP is eventually formed. However, um, a recent uh, 13C carbon labeling experiment has shown that the CO2 is not directly converted into PHP, but is stored in another metabolite first. And before I started this work, it was un unknown which metabolite this could be, but we had an hypothesis because under the chlorotic state, cells also accumulate large quantities of glycogen. So in order to test this hypothesis, is if CO2 is first stored in glycogen and then further on converted to PHB, I again created knockout strains of, um, of, of genes and proteins which were involved in the glycogen metabolism. So for example, uh, the glycogen phosphorase here. And those are the enzymes which are required to break down the glycogen. And our hypothesis was that when we delete those uh, phosphorases, then less of the carbon from the glycogen can get mobilized and um, converted towards PHP. Um, and here you can see um, the results. So what you can see in this graph is on the uh, x-axis, the duration of days, and on the y-axis, how much PHB was within the cell. And you can see the wild type, for example, here depicted in, in the black line, uh, and accumulated approximately well, 15, 20% of PHB after three weeks, which is the normal behavior. Um, but interestingly, uh, when we knocked out, so um, one of the two isoforms, and this is probably also important to understand, um, silicosystem has two different isoforms of the same enzyme, glycogen phosphorase P1 and P2. And what I could show was that only one of them is actually relevant for the mobilization of glycogen because when we knocked out the P1, it was barely any difference at all. But when we knocked out the glycogen phosphorase P2, or also created double knockout strain, we uh, were able to show that um, there was barely any PHB was produced at the end. Um, so um, the, the conclusion from this experiment is that indeed both carbon pools, the PHB and glycogen, are interconnected. All right. But until now, this was all basic research. And um, maybe you remember from the beginning of my talk, I originally started this whole project with the ambition to create overproduction strains, so strains which are really accumulating more of our bioplastic. And for this, I was really happy that I had a fourth project um, which uh, where I applied some metabolic engineering techniques. And again, to illustrate you uh, what I've done, I just do a quick recap of what I've just told you or what you just learned, which is essentially that both carbon pools, so the glycogen pool and the PHP pool are interconnected. And um, yeah, and that uh, carbon is flowing from one carbon pool to another. And fortunately, by the time, uh, it happened to be that in our laboratory in Tübingen, um, some co-workers of mine discovered a new regulatory protein which sits here um, uh, below the EMP pathway and is called SLL0944. And our hope was that if we delete this regulatory protein, then it would potentially um, increase the flux 
more or less like you open a water tap, so more flux, in our case, carbon flux can, can flow from the glycogen towards PHP. And to further improve this, I also overexpressed a bunch of different uh, genes. In this case, um, the PHP biosynthesis genes FAB, because they were known for being the rate limiting enzymes in the PHP biosynthesis. And um, of course, the intention was to uh, open the, the tab even further, so even more carbon can flow towards PHP. Um, because those are like many genes which were deleted here, I um, termed this new strain PPT1, um, uh, which is, stands for, I think, uh, PHP producer in Tübingen, or first approach of a super producing strain. And um, here you can also see on the next slides how well this strain is performing. So under these optimized conditions, uh, where, for example, uh, starved our cells from nitrogen and phosphorus and also uh, added some amount of uh, inorganic carbon source, in this case, 100 millimol of uh, sodium bicarbonate. Um, the wild type accumulated uh, maybe approximately 15% of PHP, but our optimized strain uh, achieved more than 60% at the end. And when I replace this 100 millimolar of bicarbonate with uh, some small amount of an organic carbon source, in this case uh, acetate, we were able to increase this amount even further up to 80% of carbon within the cell. And since I don't want to show you only uh, graphs and numbers, I also brought you some more electron microscopy pictures. So here you can see the wild type is a rather small um, amount of only 10% PHB and like two, two granules inside the cell. And in our optimized strains, PPT1, you can see that the um, cells are completely filled with, with carbon, uh, carbon biopolymers, PHB. And in some cases, uh, those granules were so large that they even uh, caused the rupture of the cell wall. Um, so that we have hypothesized this is like the maximum amount of how much PHB can fit inside the cell. Um, but what do we do with this now? So ideally, I mean, we are not material scientists, but we still wanted to play around with this PHP a bit. So we um, also did some attempts of purifying it. At the end, it's just like a white powder which comes out of it. Um, and um, it's relatively easy to make some, some thin plastic foils out of it. And depending on um, the additives you add to the material, in this case, for example, we added some glycerol, you can also get like different structures, different densities. Um, different material properties. But as I mentioned before, we are not material scientists, so our goal is to merely um, just produce the, the, the raw resources and then let um, other smart scientists do the rest of the job. Um, and there are already quite a few applications currently on the market for PHP. Uh, one of the more common one is to use PHP as medical screws. Um, the reason is that um, since PHP is biodegradable, if you break your bone, you can just use one of those bioplastic screws uh, to screw your bones together. And then after a couple of months or so, um, those um, screws will naturally degrade and you don't need a second surgery to remove the screws again. Another common application for such kind of plastics, uh, for PHP particularly, is uh, mulch foil. Um, so this is just used to, to cover the um, yeah, small seedlings and um, they can just like leave the, the foil uh, behind in nature and don't have to like um, recycle it or collect it again. And then finally, also for packaging, for example, this company Lace has already uh, produced this chips bag, which uh, is made out of PHP mostly. But um, we, we don't want to stop here. We ideally we would like to go even beyond that. So what I've showed you was that we sort of like created this cyanobacterium, which fixes CO2, stores this in the form of glycogen, which is powered by the energy of the sun. And then we can use this PHP for the production of bioplastics. But ideally we would go even beyond that by, for example, thinking about alternatives. So what would, for example, happen if we delete the PHP biosynthesis genes? Where would the carbon go? Well, ideally, um, maybe we could think about other uh, roads. For example, if we overexpress the, um, the fatty acid biosynthesis, then this could also become a source of uh, biofuels long term. 
So the vision, as for many of you guys as well, is to create a biological machine which converts sunlight and CO2 into sustainable products. And with this, I'm almost done with my um, sales pitch of my research. Um, so what's the current status of this project? Uh, at the University of Tübingen, they currently still working on this and trying to develop the next generation of this strain. Um, we were also contacted by uh, some investors um, and together with the Umweltforschungszentrum, so the Environmental Research Center uh, in Germany, uh, we are also working on upscaling the, um, the whole uh, process. For example, in these so-called Christmas tree photobioreactors, I guess you can guess where the name comes from. And then finally, during my postdoc at the UBC, uh, we collaborated with a small company called Alga Bloom. Uh, which is producing those um, so-called alga boxes, another kind of uh, photobioreactors, to produce uh, cyanobacteria bacteria in a larger scale. So, this being said, I hope uh, you're convinced that my uh, research is awesome and um, that we should all uh, keep working on um, sun bacteria and, uh, and and buy my fancy PHP bioplastic. Um, I don't want to finish this talk though without um, mentioning the limitations of this research. Um, because I think uh, just like with my research, it's it's a it's a general problem. Um, I'm I'm pretty certain that it would take at least five, rather 10, maybe 15 years until my bioplastic will be on the market. And uh, at the same time though. Um, the, the oceans are already completely packed with plastic right now. Climate change is happening right now. I don't know how, how hot it was this year in the Okanagan, uh, but when I was studying in, um, in Vancouver last year, uh, this small town Luton just burned down because it was freaking 50 degrees out there. Um, yeah, I guess you're all aware that our global crises are more dramatic than ever, and um, we should not rely on um, technical innovations, which uh, firstly might take too long and um, also have some downsides. A uh, couple of other of those very uh, well praised um, uh, yeah, technologies are, for example, uh, electric vehicles like Tesla. I guess, I mean, uh, since I'm coming from Germany and I just recently read that Tesla is, is um, the value of Tesla as a company is higher than all of the German car companies combined. So they're really successful and I I wish them all the best because I'm convinced we need more electric vehicles. But then again, uh, it comes for a price, right? So um, I don't know if you've ever seen these lithium mines um, in, in South America, or I guess you also need these rare metals from certain parts in Africa, for example, uh, which have a big impact on the environment. And then you also need to produce the electricity, of course, which could come from hydropower, for example. My partner is working in this field, and she keeps she keeps reminding me that hydropower uh, is in general a good idea, but it also has lots of disadvantages. Uh, one of them is, for example, that it's uh, dramatically disturbing the ecosystem where it um, those uh, dams are built. And then another example is uh, could be biofuels. Um, Throughout my bachelor, I did my thesis work at the UC Berkeley, and there worked on a, a big biofuel um, project. And uh, while it, it sounds pretty pretty nice and, and promising, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys have also heard about the, the downsides. For example, that um, people uh, burn down rainforest um, with, uh, with the excuse to, to save the climate there, which obviously doesn't make very much sense. So uh, long story short, um, I guess we we have to be really careful with which technological innovations we are relying on and which um, sales pitches from the industry we are trusting. Um, when it comes to plastic, and this is like I think almost my my last slide, um, this is I think a nice summary of what we should actually do beyond developing fancy uh, biological machines. Uh, we should first and most of all reduce uh, the amount of plastic we produce and we use. Uh, it's easy as that. I mean, if you don't have, if you don't produce any plastic, you don't produce any any garbage, obviously. 
which um, yeah, which you could also try to substitute with other materials. This is basically where, where my research comes in. You could use uh, fancy sono bioplastics, but you could also use um, um, just uh, paper for, for many applications. So I think uh, we just have to be a bit more open-minded there. We should also try to uh, design better products, which are easily replaceable and recyclable. We have to improve the whole um, the whole collection system and also the whole recycling system. And then finally, we should try to uh, minimize the amount of plastic trash which we are exporting to other countries. Um, and be so naive to believe that uh, those are places where they are better at recycling. Um, and the reason I'm always sharing this slide is because I think it's a nice holistic view of this problem because there are like so many different things which have to come together to solve the problem. And an interesting fun fact about this slide is, however, that if you follow all of those advices, you would only be able to reduce the overall uh, plastic trash in the oceans by uh, 80%. So there's still going to be enough 20% remaining, despite those very intense efforts here. Uh, and I guess this uh, describes quite well that as I mentioned before, we should not rely only on like one part, for example, by substituting it through new materials, but we have to uh, view it in a much more holistic way. Uh, so this being said, um, take home messages would probably be that plastic are a huge environmental threat and we should do something about it. Um, the bioplastics which are currently on the market are often problematic because they're not as biodegradable as they claim. I still firmly believe that cyanobacteria are promising hosts and maybe also biotechnology could help us solving some of those problems. Um, but I would only call them promising approaches, not not, not definite solutions. Um, and I would not rely on them too much. I guess it's just one, one possibility. Um, and then finally, um, as I mentioned before, I don't think that just relying on technological innovation is sufficient, but we should also think about like behavioral change, for example. Um, and then finally, I think um, this is probably potentially the most important point in my whole presentation. I am really convinced that we need much more sustainable politics. And what I mean, mean by this is, for example, that we need higher uh, carbon taxes or that we need to ban certain plastic products, because I'm afraid that this is the only time when the industry is uh, moving in the right direction, if they have the right incentives um, to operate and to use this, this, this power which capitalism offers them. This being said, uh, I hope you, um, you learned something or at least had a good time um, throughout the last 30 minutes. And um, I wish you all the best for your upcoming experiments. Um, I wish you all the best with uh, your future careers, whatever you guys want to do. And um, yeah, then enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye bye. That's a wonderful talk. Unfortunately, we'll be unable to do a QA session with Dr. Koch because this talk was asynchronous. Um, but if you do have any questions, please make sure to put them in the mirror and we'll try to get answers for those questions um, later on. Um, um, but up next, we have a talk by Renee Inkeman about synthetic chromosomes and algae. Renee Inkeman is a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute, um, and he's working to further the area of chloroplast in bio. Um, he was a representative of iGEM's plant and engineering subcommittees, as well as an instructor for the um, 2021 grand prize winning Marburg team. Um, and he's here um, to talk with us about um, this. So without further ado, um, here's the talk. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, can you see my screen? And can you hear me well? Okay. Okay, perfect. So thank you for the invitation and thank you for the chance to uh, give this talk here today. So um, I would like to talk about uh, my, my PhD project. So I'm a PhD student in the lab of Tobias Erb in Marburg, Germany. 
And my PhD is about designing, building, and testing synthetic chloroplast genomes. But before I go into the, the my actual uh, PhD research project, I would to, like to give a more broad introduction. And probably I don't need to mention this to to this audience here. And uh, probably this uh, is something uh, which is mentioned in almost every presentation introduction. But like by the year of 2015. We are about 10 billion people on this, or we will be 10 billion people on this planet. And we need to increase the food production by 60% at that time. And we will have 40% less water uh, available for that food production. But not just that, but we will also face, due to the effects of climate change, with 17% uh, harvest losses annually, we will have 20% less arable land due to climate change. We have 5.7 billion people threatened by water scarcity. So we need to find a solution for like increasing food production under these circumstances. And one uh, solution which is proposed by uh, many researchers in the world is like improving photosynthesis and like increasing uh, the yields of the crops by improving photosynthesis. But I just brought a, a quote here um, uh, that it's quite obvious that food improving photosynthesis is a good idea, but it's not as easy as it sounds. So why is it so difficult? Um, if you think about uh, photosynthesis, there's two ways of improving photosynthesis. There's the light and the carbon capturing. Let's start with the light capturing. So the whole photosynthetic machinery is a huge complex with many proteins which are interacting um, and uh, have very defined uh, expression levels. So therefore you cannot just uh, make like simple changes or, or single edits on this huge photosynthetic machinery to do large scale uh, light capturing improvement. So you, you would need a method to like, yeah, do changes on a more global level. The same goes for engineering CO2 capturing. So there's like, um, the CO2 fixation cycle, the, the, the Calvin Benson cycle. And you have uh, this very slow and unprecise enzyme, Robisco, which is the actual CO2 fixation enzyme. Um, and many people uh, think about it uh, in a way or like have the approach to replace Robisco or like even completely rewriting carbon capturing in, in photosynthetic organisms. But this would again require large scale, the capacity to do large scale um, engineering on photo, photosynthetic organisms. And at the moment, we don't have the tools to, to do large, this large scale engineering on, on, a, on a global or on a genome level. And the solution I would like to propose here, or we would like to propose here are synthetic chloroplast genomes. Again, I, I, I will take some steps back now. So what are actually chloroplasts? Probably most of you know, but like, I know that iGEM is very interdisciplinary. That's why I would like to uh, go, go a step back and, and explain everything in, in detail. So chloroplasts are the organelle of all plant cells which are where the photosynthesis is happening. Chloroplasts have their own genome, which it's way reduced compared to cyanobacteria. It's for example, about 200,000 base pairs long. And the chloroplasts has its own independent transcription and translation machinery. So that they, they have their own ribosomes, they have their own uh, polymerases. And basically ribosomes, are, are, chloroplasts are very similar to bacterial. And basically um, the whole genetics uh, of the chloroplast is more like bacteria and not so much like uh, uh, eukaryotic um, genetics. So uh, you could uh, apply many, many tools um, which you learn in bacteria in chloroplasts, although you are working with, with plants or algae. So why are chloroplasts cool to engineer or have advantage to engineer? So compared to uh, normal or like nuclear uh, plant engineering, you have high precision um, homologous recombination. So you're not integrating your constructs or your DNA um, uh, randomly, like in a nuclear transformation, but you have for homologous recombination where you can site specifically integrate something in a chloroplast genome. And therefore you have more control, more safety, and uh, yeah, it's generally more engineerable. Then you have the possibility of transgene stacking. What does this mean? So basically, um, 
uh, in bacteria, you can build like these polycystronic operons and you can do the same in chloroplast and you can, you can do several genes in a, in a synthetic operon, which you wouldn't be able to do in a plant nucleus or nuclear genome. Then you also don't have epigenetics and epigenetic gene silencing. So usually if you bring in uh, trans genes in the plants, the uh, plant tries to silence it with epigenetics. That's also not happening in the chloroplast. And then you have like very high protein expression. So like it has been shown that you can uh, express proteins to, to a level that you have like five to 10% of the um, total proteome of all proteins being the tr one transgene you want to express. So a very high protein expression capability. There's one advantage to it, which actually stands out um, from all the advantages. And that's about biocontainment. So a lot of people are very concerned when they hear about genetically modified plants and they have the fear that they could escape in the environment or that pollen are mixing with wild plants or neighboring fields. And there, there could be like um, legal issues if they, the, the GMOs are uh, pollinating the non-GMOs on the neighboring field. And uh, this, this is actually a problem in the real world already. And the improvement with chloroplast engineering would be the chloroplasts are just inherited by the female part, but so maternally. So chloroplast DNA, the normal one, but also the trans genes cannot be passed through pollen. And this reduces the risk of trans gene transmission um, uh, drastically because there's there's no like pollen with the trans gene flying away. And uh, yeah, therefore you have this improved biocontainment um, as, as a one of the biggest advantages in chloroplasts. Okay, now let's come back to my uh, actual PhD project, which is about uh, synthetic chloroplast genomes and uh, finding a method to actually replace them. And uh, I'm in my PhD actually not working with, um, with higher plants, but I'm working with a single cell green algae, but just because of the reason that it's easier to work with them. So it's a very good model system because they are still eukaryotic, yeah, uh, the genetics and everything is very close to plants, but the generation time and transformation time is way, way shorter. And I can test uh, things way more fast compared if I would do the same thing with tobacco or something. Okay, um, that's being, that being said, um, I would like to start with the design process of this uh, synthetic chloroplast genomes and go through the design principles which I chose for these synthetic chloroplast genomes. So in total, I. Uh, I synthesized, chemically synthesized two versions and they follow these design principles. For the first design principles, um, for the first principle, I wanted to tackle the problem that after introduction, I need to distinguish between synthetic and the wild type. So I need a way to distinguish if, if I do the replacement and if the replacement uh, works or like also if I do like, um, partial replacement, I need to distinguish the paths which then are synthetic or are still wild type. And for that, I introduce these watermarks or PCR tags. And that works like that, that in every gene, I recoded some of the, the amino acids to synonymous codons. And then it, this results in a different DNA sequence, although it's the same amino acid sequence. And this different DNA sequence can then be used for PCR primers and then you can like do uh, different PCRs uh, with wild type primers and with synthetic primers to distinguish which genes are now synthetic or which genes uh, are still uh, wild type. And then you can screen the whole genome uh, um, in order to find out the, the, the uh, ratio of, of synthetic and wild type. For the next problem or design feature, I would like to uh, introduce you to, to another problem for synthetic chloroplast genome. And that is that the chloroplast has not just one copy of its genome, but about a hundred in, in clammy, but or like even several thousand in plant cells. And now if you think about the transformation process, in the, in the beginning, you just transform one or two copies. And then you need to get to a state where all the genome copies are transformed or replaced with the synthetic version. And I also mentioned that the 
that there is very high homologous recombination happening. And then if you are not different enough in, with your synthetic uh, chloroplast genome, you would end up with a kind of mosaic genome, which would completely destroy your initial design because of the unwanted homologous recombination. So the goal would be to get rid of the, the wider genome copies as fast as possible to prevent this unwanted homologous recombination. And for that, we came up with the idea to use this CRISPR-Cas3 system, which is a little bit different from the Cas9 system you probably uh, all know. So the Cas3 system consists of like not just one protein, but you need these four proteins, Cas3, Cas5, Cas8, Cas7. And then you have this uh, three of them forming this complex with a CRISPR RNA, which is used for the targeting of, of the, the system. And then you have the Cas3, which is a nuclease, and basically what it is, it's similar to a Pac-Man and it has been shown that it can eat up and not just cut, eat up to up to 200,000 base pairs uh, of DNA and do deletions in that scale. So really large scale deletions. And if you uh, paid attention, the, the, the size of a chloroplast genome is about 200,000 base pairs. So the, the idea is that we can completely eat up wild type chloroplast genome copies. But now we have to uh, find a way to distinguish wild type and synthetic chloroplast genomes. And how do we do that? And now we come to the next design feature. So our synthetic chloroplast genomes just got the, some, some uh, potential sites removed, uh, which we can then target with, with different CRISPR-Cas systems. Um, so basically the wild type copy would then still remain with the with the potential sites which would then be targeted by the CRISPR system and the synthetic version does not possess any of the the, the uh, potential guide RNA sites anymore and is therefore completely untouched by the CRISPR system. So you would eat up the wild type chloroplast genome copies and the synthetic chloroplast genome copies are should be intact. Okay coming to the next uh, feature and here we want to tackle the problem that the genome of, of the chloroplast genome of, um, of Clammy is quite a mess and, uh, and it's not very easy to organize because there's, there's a lot of repeats, there's a lot of junk, there's a lot of um, uh, sequences but which are not necessary. Um, also uh, introns, which are rather a eukaryotic feature. But it has been shown that these individual features could be deleted without any phenotype. Uh, yeah, could be deleted. Now we removed all these things, but we of course don't know if if we remove all of these, if there's any like synthetic lethality effect, which means that um, there could be an effect uh, or there's no effect if you delete one, but if you delete many things, there is effect just because you uh, you haven't tested, tested it with uh, uh, multiple deletions. But that's being, uh, that's something we, we can find out with such a large scale, um, uh, large scale strategy or like edit genome replacement strategy. Okay, the last, no, not the last, but like the most ambitious feature of the synthetic chloroplast genome uh, is the recoding of codons. What does this mean? So basically, uh, the genetic code is redundant, right? And you have synonymous codons for different amino acids. And what, what I did here is that we reduced the, the, the number of stop codons from three to one. And I also recoded several arginine co uh, amino acid codons to, an, uh, to different arginine codons. And thereby I free up five codons, which are completely free and unused in the chloroplast genome. And this can then be used to, to encode completely uh, non-natural amino acids. And then you can build completely different protein with a completely set of amino acids. And this can, can uh, allow, for example, the function of uh, yeah, completely different chemistry and completely new functions uh, to proteins which, which do not exist in nature. This could, but uh, this could also be used co to completely reassign the genetic code. And this could again contribute uh, to biosafety in a way that if this genome or like this DNA escapes, 
in in any way into the environment, then it wouldn't be useful uh, in a different uh, chloroplast or a different plant if the genetic code is a little bit switched uh, and it would be toxic, for example, in, in a different context. The last feature is uh, once the tackle or comes back to the initial idea of like improving photosynthesis, what would we need for improving photosynthesis? We would need a platform to do large scale introduction of, of, um, of, of genes, large scale uh, introduction of changes. And therefore we introduce these landing pads, which would be able to, uh, where you would be able to integrate a huge amount of, of uh, extra payload or extra DNA. And these uh, integration sites even have like some more uh, features for, for further engineering. For example, they contain recombinase sites uh, or recognition sites. And if you then would inc include a recombinase, the, the, the DNA can switch to the different positions on the genome. And this would allow uh, for, for, uh, for example, directed evolution or like laboratory evolution uh, for further improvement. But this is also a proof of concept if this whole recombinase based um, uh, um, recombinase based evolution can actually work in the chloroplast. And with that, I would like to finish with the design part. Of course, there's more design features, which I haven't mentioned, but now we come to the building part. <laughs> and that for that, one needs to understand that you cannot order just a whole genome from a company, but you need to, uh, you, you are limited by the size of what, what a company can deliver. And the most, uh, the, the biggest concepts which are still kind of affordable are in the 5KB space. Uh, range. So what we have to do is basically for the building process that we need to assemble the whole genome from 5 KB fragments. And the method we are using is uh, the assembly by, by yeast. So yeast is very, very good uh, with homologous recombination. And for that, every of our 5 KB fragments contains a homology on each end which are the same sequence. And yeast can recognize these homologies and recombine uh, these DNA fragments to one fragment. This is a established or like kind of established cloning method, but for larger scale and for, for whole genomes, it's still kind of challenging. Um, yeah, and then we wanted to set, uh, see, or like we wanted to benchmark if we can do the chloroplast genome assembly in our lab. And after a lot of struggling within my PhD, uh, we got this this method to work and uh, did like a five times five KB assembly in yeast. And down there, you can just see a colon PCR, which is basically showing the overlaps of two assembly of, of, of like the two neighboring fragments every time. So basically, I could show that that I have uh, assembled these five pieces here via colony PCR. And subsequently, we did, of course, also uh, sequencing if the whole plasmid is assembled in, in that way. But then we were thinking, okay, this is still like quite slow to, to uh, assemble whole genomes if you want to have a rapid method for synthetic chloroplast genome assembly. And for that, we even looked into other protocols and there's there are these like famous papers from Craig Venter where they uh, uh, built like a minimal bacterial genome and there's not many labs in the world who can actually do this super large scale uh, yeah, DNA assembly on a chromosome level. And so therefore I, I needed to optimize a lot, but the goal was to, to assemble half of a chloroplast genome in one step. And after a lot of optimization, I also got this to work. And now I, we are able to assemble half of a chloroplast genome in one step, basically three days, four days, and and the half of the chromosome is, is assembled. Uh, and again, here it's just like a colony PCR gel where I assembled all the, uh, verified all the overlaps of the neighboring uh, fragments. Okay, now we come to a problem uh, which is specific for chloroplast transformation because 
For chloroplast transformation, or for like getting DNA into the chloroplast, you need a lot of DNA. And you cannot get as much DNA as you would need from yeast cultures. So we need to go back into E. coli with our hugely assembled synthetic chromosomes. And the process of get from, uh, getting from yeast to E. coli seems to be easy, but it was definitely not. So there's many technical challenges. Um, and one of them was that the, the chloroplast genome contains, for example, ribosomal genes, which are very similar to the ones in E. coli. And therefore, E. coli doesn't like my, my synthetic chloroplast genome at all and tries to either mutagenize, delete, or get rid of it as fast as possible. Now, after a lot of optimization, I have now a protocol that I can like move back the synthetic chloroplast genome fragments into E. coli so that it's still kind of happy with it and that I can get enough DNA for chloroplast transformation out of it. So the next step is from after building is testing. And instead of like going for the whole chloroplast genome or half of the chloroplast genome, we, we took a step back and wanted to test 25 KB fragments uh, of the synthetic chloroplast genome in order to find bugs or like problems or errors in our genome design. Because we assume that we didn't do a perfect job on, on the design or like that there's some problems with the design. And with like smaller fragments, you can find these, uh, these problems more easily. And again, we came across problems and uh, the stuff didn't work. So basically what I try here is like having my 25 KB synthetic chloroplast genome and having like antibiotic selection markers flanking to this, this synthetic piece. But then we found out that just one of the selection markers, antibiotic selection markers, um, the spectinomycin works and no other synthetic uh, antibiotic selection marker reported actually worked in our hands. So we had to go back in the design and, uh, and find out or like uh, establish antibiotic selection markers for the chloroplast of Clammy. And um, now we have like um, a few at hand after a lot of testing, a lot of um, experiments. Uh, and now we can flank our synthetic chloroplast pieces with two different antibiotic markers and uh, do the transformation. And we are currently at the stage of, of, um, of introducing these, these um, synthetic chloroplast genome fragments. And then it's about like, what kind of phenotypes do they cause? Can they still grow uh, phototrophically? Can they just grow uh, uh, if we add the carbon source and find out if we did any errors? And we will use uh, different omics methods, for example, proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, to evaluate the phenotypes uh, of our synthetic chloroplast genome fragments. So you can imagine if I now test all these different pieces, all these like 25 KB pieces and have a lot of uh, biological replicates and like testing maybe not just like uh, the same um, parts, but like also other parts of the genome or like different, uh, how to say, uh, not just um, uh, the, the same defined uh, quarters, for example, but like to starting at and ending at a different uh, point then I would have a lot of different strings. And usually with Clammy, you just streak them out by hand and then you have eight strands on, on, one, uh, on one plate, but this is not scalable for our project at all. And what we, are, we have established here is basically an automation pipeline for Clammy, which on the one hand can use this picking robot, which is actually rather built for E. coli and yeast. And we putting the, 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 the transformed uh, Chloroplast transform Clammy into in an array on these agar plates. And then we can use the, the next robot here, uh, which is basically just a fancy stem um, uh, to, to copy these uh, arrays on different plates. And you can see on the right a picture how it would, would look like after they are grown. And basically, we can keep a lot of strains, like hundreds or thousands of strains, and copy them in rather minutes instead of like hours or days uh, if you would do it by hand with the classical method you're using for Clammy. And uh, 
yeah, we can also use this robot here, for example, to, to, to stamp them on different media conditions on a different, uh, um, on a minimal media, on a media with carbon source or under different stress conditions to evaluate the different phenotypes of the synthetic chloroplast genome. So basically, I would like to summarize um, uh, the, the talk. So my, my vision is to develop a rapid method for the implementation of synthetic chloroplast genomes, and that these chloroplast uh, genomes might contain completely redesigned photosynthesis models, that we can improve photosynthesis by using completely redesigned synthetic chloroplast genomes. What we have already accomplished is that we have designed and chemically synthesized these two color, uh, chloroplast genome uh, versions. We established this large scale uh, chloroplast genome assembly uh, of, from, from fragments. We've developed a lot of tools which are needed for, for the chloroplast engineering process. And what we are currently doing is uh, actually transforming these synthetic uh, genome fragments into the chloroplast, evaluating the phenotype, and then going for even more replacement. And we are also currently kind of independently, and I haven't talked much about it because of time reasons, uh, have established uh, or yeah, have established this CAS3 system for the rapid genome replacement so that we would be able to eat up the wild type genome copies uh, as fast as possible. And with that, I would like to already uh, um, thank many people who uh, contributed to, to all of the work and without them, it wouldn't be possible. So first of all, my professor Tobias Erb, but also my um, Daniel Schindler, who is helping with the robots and the automation. Anke Becker is my co-supervisor of my thesis, uh, as well as, uh, as Ralf Bock, who is an expert on core plus transformation. And then I would also like to, to especially thank uh, my students and uh, student workers Michael, who is uh, insanely good at cloning and uh, helped me a lot with the project and the project design. Cedric, uh, who is a, 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 bio a computer a mathematician and computer scientist by training, uh, who helped me a lot with like designing, uh, designing primers, uh, writing uh, Python scripts. Uh, then Laura, who is working on the CRISPR system um, and still finishing up her bachelor thesis. And Jessica, uh, who is uh, my, my one of my student workers and will start with her bachelor thesis uh, bachelor thesis soon with me and then also what all my other other colleagues and my whole art the whole art group and with that uh, I would also like to thank you for your attention and I'm very happy if there's any questions yeah thank you for the talk yes we do have some time um ask questions and we do have a few in the mirror board right now that I'll read off. Um, one question is, um, what is your personal experience with automation and how has it improved your research progress? Mm -hmm. So um, we, we try to establish automation very early on in my PhD. So we, we, the automation already starts when building the construct. So we have uh, uh, acoustic liquid handler, which is super cool. You should look it up. I don't want to explain it in detail, but uh, you should uh, look up the echo liquid handler. Uh, and we can build like uh, uh, plasmids uh, or like do the cloning in an automated way, um, uh, especially golden gates. And then uh, if we talk about uh, phototrophic organism automation, uh, it was quite hard to get get it to work because um, yeah all these machines and the, the, the colony picking are made for E. coli and rather made for E. coli and yeast for example the a standard model organism but uh, yeah it was not super established for for clammy but now as we have it it's insane how much this uh, uh, helped us and to increase our throughput so I think my project wouldn't be possible if uh, we wouldn't have the, the automation right now. Is most of your time in the lab spent on thinking about like your next experimental steps and like examining your results rather than like actually doing the experiments now? Unfortunately not. <laughs> so 
we, we are not at that stage that like everything is automated. I would like to have that. So for example, the uh, mini preps or something like that are still not on the stage. There, it's, it is possible to, to, to automate almost everything or including mini preps, but we don't have like a completely integrated um, integrated uh, solution for the automation or something like that. So like I do spend a lot of time still at the bench. Uh, also like claw plus transformation is a super uh, tedious and not automatable uh, protocol at all so i don't know if you have any any one of you have seen a gene gun but basically uh this is the complete opposite of high throughput and complete opposite of automation <laughs> yeah okay um we have a few more questions another one is does transforming such synthetic chloroplast genomes present challenges due to their size yes it does so like there's a lot of problems um, before the transformation already. So for example, um, when working with constructs which are above a certain threshold, so about 40, 50,000 base pairs, then you can even not pipette them with normal pipette tips anymore because they get destroyed by pipetting. Just as an example, that's even not talking about the transformation. And then like every shear force is like, problematic for for the um um yeah for the for the intactness of the dna so we are currently thinking about different other ideas to circumvent that and to adapt the protocol in a way that we can circumvent or like um yeah get rid of this problem but it's definitely a problem yes another one we have is um what are the main challenges you face when working to assemble very large DNA fragments? Mm -hmm. So uh, on the one hand, I already mentioned the, uh, the the shearing of the DNA. Then like E. coli at some point, the transformation efficiency goes down quite drastically at a certain point. So 20 KB, 25, 30 KB, it's still totally fine. But then like, for example, when I transformed the 120 KB into E. coli, it was horrible. So um, I needed the, the most efficient uh, electrocompetent cells I could find um, to get this into E. coli again um, with electroporation. And then, like, every protocol is not suited for this kind of size or, like, not very much established. So, for example, normal mini preps don't work anymore. Uh, and you need, like, a special protocol for that. So... The, the, the challenge is that it's not, it seems that it's a solved problem on paper because there's paper about, there are papers about it, but it's not as easy as it looks in, in the, in the papers because yeah, it's just like, I, th I feel that there, there's just like a handful or like if, I don't know, a few dozen people in the world who actually do chromosome level DNA assembly. Yeah. All right. Uh, perhaps I would jump in and ask actually two questions. Um, first of all, I uh, wondered in regards of uh, for, for for the other um, item teams here um, mm -hmm. for a human practice. Um, ass assuming uh, that not only the safety of chloroplast transformation uh, is quite beneficial would there also be an effect of like what we usually see is that a farmer has to rebuy a stock of um, uh, seeds etc because after several generations usually the um, mutations or you, even if it's not a gmo but like just beneficial mutations are often silenced or just crossed yeah. out again and would we see uh, something else in uh, chloroplast so because it's like avoids the silencing so um so there's there's of course no like commercial example yet because there's no commercial crop uh, at the moment which is chloroplast transformed but just from the science i would say it should be more stable and like i i strongly believe that um yeah the the the, the lines or the, the 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 plant lines should weigh more be consistent and stable than um, 
uh, than normal nuclear engineering. So there's no gene silencing, as you mentioned, but also it has been shown just very recently that the mutation rate in the corpus is also very much lower than in, uh, in the normal genome, which is also quite interesting. But it, it, on the one hand explains why the evolution of photosynthesis is so slow and that, they, that, it, that it didn't reach its optimum yet. But on the other hand, it also allows for like a better control of what is happening because the mutation rate is, is slower. Um, and therefore, I, I do believe that uh, due to the, these reasons that the, the lines should be more consistent and more reliable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, my second question uh, is from a very uh, different angle as a completely uh, synthetic bi biology Neanderthal myself. Um, I, I just wondered when you uh, mentioned how you assemble the big constructs uh, in the uh, um, how is yes. it called again yeast again okay. yeah so, sure sorry um, in the yeast um, I recall that uh, back in our iGEM project we used uh, a golden gate um, mm -hmm. and just just a very basic question like um, is there like why would you not use something like golden gate and uh, something like a recombination the yeast yeah so like you could definitely use for like twenty five thousand base pairs maybe even fifty thousand base pairs you could use golden gate and it would also make sense in a way but at, at a certain point um the cloning efficiency in e coli is just not good enough anymore and um uh yeah cloning and then transformation efficiency into e coli is not good enough anymore and that's the only limitation um to a certain point but like i could use it for like the the lower assemblies and then use these these golden gate assemblies with in, in yeast again um and it's also kind of what i do for some of, of the pieces um but it's just like a matter of um how big you build the context at a certain point it's not possible to work with golden gate and uh e coli anymore for the first cloning mm -hmm. All right, thank you. No problem, you're welcome. <laughs> Is there any further question or comment or feedback? Mm, one question from my side, so a bit more open towards the um, phototroph topic. Um, what do you think about the current status on um, consensus regarding the community about uh, standardizations, protocols? What are we lacking and what should be the, um, what should we try to aim for? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So when I entered, for, I, I just want to give a small anecdote if we have time. Um, like when I entered this, this algae field here and, and, and like uh, the, the chloroplast field and I wanted to do the chloroplast transformation, the protocol is so uh, badly described that I, couldn't do it on my own. So like, it, there's no way, in, I believe, that someone can do a cloud plus transformation without someone who knows it teaching him. So not, not with the video, not with the, um, uh, not with the paper. So like, you need someone who teaches you with experience. And I find that quite ridiculous. So in my, my wish would be that like, things like the, the cloud plus transformation as an example, but also other uh, parts of the photoshops, um, photographic work should be described super well. And then what we also re just realized in the lab is that like the light, not just the light intensity, but also the light, uh, yeah, the light spectrum had a huge effect on 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 our outcome of our experiment. So that basically the different lens even though they had the same intensity, like different lamps had different experimental outcomes and that, that was crazy for us. Um, so I would like to, or like I would wish that at some point that we like can like standardize in, that in a way that things with Photoshop become more reproducible. Uh, and I, I, I think that for, for plants, this is even more severe because then you have soil and you have, um, yeah, a fertilizer, whatever. And like, I think many things of these are not standardized at all.
Yeah, if this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Anything else? If not, thank you for, for your attention and it was nice to, to present here. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much, Renee, that was really nice. So with that said, uh, we conclude the first, the big portion of this event. And we want to thank all of you for this section. Um, we, we work really hard to try to bring all these people together so that we can talk and really feel. And I hope that you kind of all feel the need of why we need to, to work more on these organisms. And that's why we are still celebrating and we are trying to help all these people that have joined our community and, and the still growing community in the photo drops. This next section is going to be all about the Photodraft showcase, about the different projects that are going on right now in IGEM 2022. So the way that this is going to work is that we ask these groups to prepare in some way so that they can tell us what are they doing, what are they facing, what are their current status in their projects, and why are they doing what they're doing. It can be in informed slides of um, a poster-like session. What we're going to do is that we're going to go one after the other, and we're going to start presenting again like an update. Keep in mind that right now we have some people that have not seen your projects in the past and many things have happened in the last weeks and we've seen each other for the first time. So uh, without further ado, what I'm going to do is that we're gonna give about five minutes for everyone to get ready. And we're gonna start going in the order that we're gonna show in a bit in the slides. So that, yeah, we can see what everyone's doing, give some time for you to present and sometimes so that we can discuss, you can use the mirror as well so that you can have more comments, questions. And depending on how this goes, we may be able to go to a more um, in-depth discussion, either breakout rooms or continuing here. So five more minutes, we're gonna give about five minutes. We're gonna return here about, um, yeah, in about five minutes and yeah. Um, quick question. <laughs> sure. Uh, for the biocord people, uh, how will we handle the breakout rooms, etc., or do you think that uh, it even makes much sense from this point on. Sure, uh, so the idea is that um, at this point, considering how the amount of people that we have, we're probably going to stay in this uh, general room. In case it doesn't mm -hmm. work, we can always allow um, bring them in in the Zoom. All right. So yeah, see you everyone in five minutes.
just for our own people here in the chat, um, little information, uh, since some have joined now again, uh, we're waiting like three more minutes, I think, or four more minutes, and then we will continue with a rather, I think, focused talk about the uh, projects about the other teams, if I could recall correctly. Yeah, so rather in that direction. Hello, Vanessa. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just want to ask you uh, if you could mute yourself real quick. All right. So I think I will just write into the chat. There's a little break. Okay, and we are back. So uh, we'll be starting this. So I'm going to show my screen here. Our screen. Okay. You, you got it. Okay. Good. So. There we go. So yeah, um, hello everyone. We are the UVCO Agem team. And this year we are coming up with our project, which is LIFO. Basically it all started because of the idea of um, thinking about some of the problems that we have right now. Humanity has been needed light for everything. We cannot imagine a world without it. Um, we, in the last hundred years, we got the opportunity to create artificial light, which has helped us in many ways. So light is everywhere, but it has some problems. It consumes energy in the way that it does, and also some of it goes, contributes to the greenhouse gases. We've seen throughout this meeting that, it's, um, that there are many things involved. So it's not only the energy that's causing it, but there's also the problem of light pollution. So light pollution is basically the, um, how the misuse of light is a secondary thing that happens that when we, are, we have so much light, some of it escapes and it's not doing what we really mean it to do. So the light actually can affect wildlife. You all know the stories about, um, for example, the sea turtles. What happens with them is that they naturally, because of their biology, they get guided because of the moon to, to go towards the ocean. Artificial light gets them the other way. Insects, their populations are declining, mostly because of light as well. Birds get lost because of the migrations and they end up in cities or crashing into buildings. There are many stories of how light which 
life right now has not been able to evolve with in terms of artificial light. And it's not only affecting this solar essence, it's affecting us. Life has been evolving with life for a long time and we have formed what we call the circadian rhythms by keeping us awake with light during the night and certain wavelengths and certain amounts of luminous, luminosity is affecting our psychology. It's affecting how we behave. There are some even some studies that even link the effects of circadian rhythm disruption with cancer. So there's a huge problem that we have right now. So what we try to do this year in, with our team is to look in bi for in biology for answers. How can life give light? And the direct answer is what we call bioluminescence. Bioluminescence is this thing from biology to produce light. It has evolved for many different reasons. It's because producing light um, to, to attract predators, to get rid of them, to hide, to get uh, uh, partners, whatever. And what we try to do here is to try to bring all of this together. In our team, we're trying to imagine a world that is illuminated by life. And this image is very glowy in our company, but. What we try to do is to imagine a world that is literally illuminated by light, a dim glow that can be harnessed by us, that can be grown, something that we can even fit with, uh, with our waste. Let's make it even greener and feed it with the energy of the sun. So that's where life pole comes in. Our project is to transform cyanobacteria, in this case in the ecosystem species C6803, to, with fungal genes or bioluminescence, to try to come up with a way of expand of producing light in a green way, in many different ways, actually. So I have to carry on with that. Mm. So uh, as Gustavo touched on, the end goal of our project is to engineer Synecocystis SP PCC6003, a strain of cyanobacteria with a bioluminescent pathway from fungi. Specifically, the pathway that we're expressing in cyanobacteria converts caffeic acid into 3-hydroxyhispidin, which is then oxidized in a light-emitting reaction and recycled back into caffeic acid. Although cyanobacteria don't naturally produce caffeic acid, previous studies have successfully expressed caffeic acid production in Synecocystis, enabling us to produce a carbon-negative light source without the addition of external substrates. We also plan on participating in the IGEM 2022 interlab study, performing mutagenesis to alter the wavelength or quantity of light produced, and using circadian promoters to express bioluminescence at specific times of day. Bioluminescent cyanobacteria possess a wide range of applications beyond just traditional lighting. Bioluminescence serves as a unique, promising, and profound medium to convey artistic expression. Bioluminescent art and design has an unparalleled ability to sustainably convey the beauty of the natural world that is especially relevant within the art and culture of Indigenous Canadians and local Indigenous artists. Our project demonstrates that synthetic biology can be more than just practical, it can be beautiful as well. By demonstrating what beautiful things SynBio is capable of creating, we hope to improve the public perception in the field and reduce the stigma surrounding GMOs. We've also assessed the competitive advantages of our project, including its ability to reduce light pollution, as Gustavo touched on, uh, its ecological friendliness, and its positive environmental impacts, uh, and a wide range of applications beyond just practical lighting and everything from artwork to city planning. So in order to uh, produce these bioluminescent cyanobacteria, we have explored the possibility of creating uh, biocontainment vessels for consumer products in, uh, based on these models produced from previous biotech companies exploring similar uh, topics. And another component of our dry lab is looking at the metabolic engineering of this pathway in cyanobacteria. And here's just a poster that summarizes a lot of the major aspects of our project. Some of the updates and things that we've been doing now is that uh, we've been reaching out to many different people, including light designers, artists, bio artists. Um, we, our objective with this is that we learn a lot of things. There's a lot of things in light that we have to consider. What we want to do is to bring this new tool so that we can create with it. We can also engage the community. Indigenous communities are really important for us in the Okanagan. And what we wanted to do is to try to communicate with them so they can tell us how will a system like this help them? 
how can we create something like that? And we've been actually challenged by some of these artists to think big, think in a new way of bringing the community together. What about a system where we have like a light source and that can be grown, something that can be, for example, delivered to your place, you take care of it. It's like, a, we kind of jokingly said that it's a extreme Tamagotchi because you have to take care of it. It's something that is literally alive. Then we can take it like in a milk, um, in like in a milkman manner and create this. We were, we were even told that maybe we, we can think beyond that and have like a system, a ritual system celebrating life, celebrating life that is out there, how we can all gather together and think about it. This system can be later returned and put it to get put it again into bioreactors and how we can produce more, like a life cycle, literally. So with all that said, at the stage where we are is that we have successfully gathered our level zeros using Moco. We are in the stage of getting the level ones. And what we want to do in this um, year at least is to show that this system can be applied in these prokaryotes in cyanobacteria. With hopefully the, the idea of making this a total different way of producing life. Maybe we're not going to be the LEDs at any point, but it's really important for us to bring this new tool into the table. It can be improved. As we've seen before in this meeting, light right now is um, powered by electricity. And electricity, yeah, it can be green, but not even all the sustainable sources are good. Here in BC, most of our green energy comes from hydroelectric. But as we've seen, for example, from um, the talk from Dr. Um, Moritz, Hydroelectric can be also damaging to the ecosystems. So with that all in mind, that's why we believe that LiPo can be a really interesting and nice project that we want to pursue. So yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. So if anyone has any questions, comments, please feel free to bring them or even in the mirror. Yeah. yeah. If uh, you don't mind, I would ask a question. Um, so just to recap real quick, uh, you basically say, OK, um, we have a problem with light pollution, uh, which is, mm -hmm. uh, well, obvious. Um, <laughs> um, and do you see like um, the bioluminescence as a way to replace electric lights now? like not perhaps in every manner but like in general and uh, did, did i understand you here correctly yeah so as you said um, uh, oh, sorry continue yeah because if so i would wonder in what way is it like if we imagine a world where we can Im uh, replace electric light with bioluminescence in a way that like the bioluminescence actually is on the level to um, provide enough light to like be competitive, viable, I guess. How is the light pollution of a bioluminescence any different than to electric light? Sure. So as you said, this will be a system that can be used in very specific cases. Uh, at the level that we have right now in bioluminescence, it's probably not going to be a lot. Um, until we don't get the, res the experimental results, we'll not be able to know how luminous, luminous it is. But our goal is that we are definitely going to get some kind of light, something that is dim. So where we envision this to be placed is in areas at night, that like parks that are outside of um, of big cities or the coastal areas, or even for in, um, for malls or internal decorations where you don't need a lot of light. And as well, we have to take into account our ability to adjust to light. So uh, our goal is just to bring something new to the table. We are not competing with LEDs, but we want to to bring a, a new thing into into the entire into the entire yeah. part. Yeah, I definitely see the idea of um, especially. I, I actually love the idea of um, using it as an artistic uh, tool. Um, mm -hmm. Really love love it, um, especially because I fully agree that this way uh, we can tackle uh, a lot of like distrust and I like break into um, into the wider society. Um, the more we use it in ways that are approachable and understandable uh, for everybody, uh, the better it is. Um, I do believe that with um, like actual practic practicability in like our society for like 
for example, to replace light. It's very far fetched from for now. Um, so perhaps if you, uh, I, I, I hope I don't like overstep here, like, uh, but um, if you present it later to judges, etc., cetera, um, I would be very careful with that um, because otherwise they will probably ask the same question of like, okay, if you produce enough light to replace light sources like electricity, then how is it any better than the light sources that you replace? Mm -hmm. uh, beside, of course, um, that it's uh, more eco-friendly perhaps, but then again, you would have other problems like, for example, okay, um, if we have suddenly an organism that actually produces light, how do we impact, for example, certain um, ecosystems with that? Uh, what if, like, for example, my forest starts glowing and, um, I mean, the spiders would have a feast, but like all the bugs are dying. Um, like you, you face a lot of problems if you enter that kind of area, um, unless you have like it very, very much patched out um, into like biosafety, etc. But the artistic part of your project is fucking amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely something that we are looking into. The part of biosafety, biosecurity is something that we care a lot. Uh, right now, our, our containment systems is what we are uh, focusing on. And that specific part that we want to put this in very specific places, in very specific ways. And as we mentioned with Ryan before, one of our initial goals was to use this as a tool to show people that GMOs can be beautiful. So there's a huge stigma. And I believe that for all of us, it will be really impactful to try to bring the community in, in a more friendly manner towards whatever we're doing now. So yeah, definitely. Thank you. we should proceed with the next team. Okay, oh, we can go. start screen sharing. Um, Carney and I are part of the UBC Vancouver team and thank you for um, letting us present to you all today. Okay, so I think some of us, some of you might have heard about our project already from before, but just to give a brief kind of overview, um, our project this year is called um, Synestivum. So we're trying to develop a genetically engineered tool for um, basically developing heat resilient wheat crops. Um, and to provide some background on why we chose this problem overall. Um, so we noticed in the last couple of years that climate change has led to heat waves and it has really impacted our local region of British Columbia here in Canada and also North America overall. And we've seen extreme record setting temperatures in the past couple of years, which has led to a lot of heat stress in plants. And we've seen um, because of these high temperatures and drought that's caused by global warming, we've seen a lot of um, stunted growth and decreased crop yield for different plants, like including berries, like raspberries, and even other crops as well. And that's coming from the farmers that we've spoken to in our local areas as well. And we've noticed that um, we chose to focus on wheat because it comprises 20% um, of the world's dietary calories and protein as well. So it's a really important staple crop worldwide. And Canada is also the fifth largest producer of wheat. So it makes us really best situated to work on this kind of project. Um, and past efforts to make crops that are climate resistant um, use stable gene expression. And so they're aiming to make transgenic gene, transgenic lines. And our project although focuses on heat inducible expression, which we believe will be more ethical and um, will only come into play with our genetic circuit when it is required during times of extreme temperatures. Um, and we also hope to do our part in striving to achieve the sustainable developmental goals um, of zero hunger and also responsible and sustainable production. Um, and so for our human practices so far, we've been doing a couple of farm visits around our local areas, around British Columbia. Um, we've met with a couple of different um, wheat farms um, and we've learned a lot about um, how important it is to um, focus on a project surrounding climate change and heat stress because um, some of this has impacted a lot of the crops nearby. Like, so this is very close to home. And we learned a lot about how 
um, different temperatures and increasing temperatures specifically impact um, the kind of wheat that is produced and the protein and the dietary content within that wheat. So the quality of crop actually suffers depending on um, the temperatures. And so we want to focus on making um, a heat inducible system that will be able to withstand high temperatures. Um, and so for, for our um, outreach, we've also been looking at um, developing a sustainable production and consumption uh, podcast series and inviting a bunch of speakers um, who can talk to some of these different um, impacts of um, sustainable production um, in different areas. Um, and we've, some of you might have also uh, seen, we've been working on having a couple of different panels. So we've had um, talks on genetic engineering um, and the ethics of using GMOs since um, the UBCO team also mentioned how GMOs are very stigmatized. Um, and we're doing kind of our part in um, alleviating some of that stigma. And we also had a, a recent panel on international accessibility to SynBio and how um, different countries or different regions that vary in socioeconomic status might not have the same kind of resources or opportunities for SynBio. So um, looking at different ways to um, change that infrastructure and make it more accessible. Um, and over on the kind of wet lab side, um, our main circuit or our main um, genetic design consists of three different kind of um, enzymes and each of them is, um, we're hoping to use them for a different purpose to overall kind of get to that um, final product of making plants more resilient um, and making them um, not have stunted growth and not have impairments in photosynthesis like we see in plants that are heat stressed. Um, so our plan is to currently use um, SPPAs, which is a Calvin cycle enzyme that increases grain yield. Um, we're using ACC deaminase, which breaks down um, the ethylene precursor, um, which is involved in stress signaling in different plants. And we're also using um, choline monooxygenase, which synthesizes glycine bedding, which is a protective osmolite in plants. And it helps to um, kind of conserve some of that plant function during times of heat. Um, and since our model kind of organism is wheat, we'll be testing, or we're currently testing um, the effect of these um, genetic circuits on wheat protoplasts, which are basically just um, plant cells without the cell wall. So they're easily transfectable. And we're, we've been um, seeing some good progress on that end as well. So we've been isolating our protoplasts and working on um, transfection at the moment. And then I'll just hand it over to Kimia to talk about dry lab. Yeah, in order to support our wet lab and our project scope, the dry lab members of our team have been undergoing several different projects. One of them being we're conducting a bioinformatic analysis to better understand how different abiotic stress conditions affect our species of wheat. So specifically, we have found um, open source RNA-seq data um, in different databases online. And what we are doing is in combined heat and drought stressed wheat, we try to determine what are the differentially expressed genes. So which genes are, for example, upregulated in heat and drought stress, which ones are downregulated, their expression is downregulated, and to be able to see on a larger level which pathways and which reactions are upregulated or downregulated. And then we'll like to see, is there any overlap between, for example, the genes from our analysis and the genes that we will be expressing in our wet lab. So basically work that can either confirm or suggest otherwise within dry lab. And for example, the visual here, it's a bit hard to see, but this is just a chart that is showing some of the most frequent biological processes that are upregulated in combined heat drought stress plants. So it's hard to see here, but the processes include things like protein folding, um, response to heat, um, regulation of transcription, and these are all pretty confirmatory because in upregulated um, the upregulated genes in these heat stress plants include things like chaperone proteins and heat shock factors that try to um, protect the protein folding in these high temperatures. And then other aspects of our dry lab for mathematical modeling, we're trying to just develop a system of equations that can be used to describe the heat inducible gene expression and enzyme kinetics of our reactions. And we're even partnering with 
an Indian iGEM team, ICER Pune, and they are helping us do some climate modeling work in order to identify areas, areas in BC that would be susceptible to heat waves um, using satellite data and different um, programs. And then for our hardware component, we have a few members of our team that are trying to de design a device. It's basically an Arduino-based fluorometer that will be able to indirectly detect heat stress by seeing whether or not there is fluorescent activation in leaves of the wheat. So as you can see from our wet lab circuits, um, these, these genes, when they're expressed, there's also a fluorescent protein that would be expressed. So if we are able to detect, for example, basically excite the plant at a certain wavelength and detect the emitted light, we can indirectly measure whether or not there is heat stress, um, as well as use other sensors like temperature sensors and humidity sensors within the device. So these are all different um, sub projects within our dry lab that we are conducting to support the other aspects of our project. And we're, we're happy to take any questions if anyone has any, but thank you. Um, okay, <laughs> once again, hello, it's me. I um, have, do have a quick question. <laughs> ah, okay, Actually. then you go first. Um, so I represent the um, mathematical modeling team for ASU's iGEM, and I'm curious to see what kind of modeling, like tools you implement for your climate modeling, especially since nowadays we run into issues with like misrepresentation of climate modeling data and how it's being presented to the public. So what kinds of like things or tasks are you taking to ensure that you're trying to get the most accurate kind of model? Okay, I can do my best to answer your question, although I'm not one of our climate modeling members. So I know that right now we are partnering with that team and they're using different um, software such as QGIS and these sort of softwares, they use satellite data. So ideally what we're looking at, we're looking at past data that's already been collected and looking at specific areas in Canada that um, are growing spring wheat and who have experienced specific temperatures um, above a threshold that would be considered in heat waves. And maybe if you could repeat your question um, or let me know if I've answered it again. No, that's sufficient, thank you. Okay. All right, then I would uh, like to ask a question again which is basically a little bit building upon the talk we heard earlier from René. Um, we know that plants have a tendency to yeet out basically everything um, that they do not like in their own genome. Um, how stable do you actually uh, think this, uh, like why or rather complex, I would say, uh, changes that you introduce will actually be in the plant if you like grow uh, like a wheat plant do you actually think that this will work yeah so that's actually a good question um so far we've been focusing on just um being able to um, express these enzymes in like a protoplast kind of system and um after that, our next stage would be to use like agroinfiltration to kind of um, be able to transfect like plants that are already at a certain at, at a certain developmental stage. Um, so we're hoping that this can be something like in the future. It could be something like a product that's maybe sprayed onto um, plants to be able to like have like bacteria transfect those plants during times of or just before times of um, like heat waves. And so we we're hoping to create something like a not a stable um, expression, but kind of an expression where um, only when it's needed. And that kind of also subverts some of the um, ethical, consider uh, not the considerations, but some of the stigma and some of the um, kind of ethical resistance around um, using transgenic lines. And so we're hoping that we can kind of make this um, a system that's put into use when it's needed. Um, but yeah, in terms of kind of how this would um, how this kind of a system would interact with other pathways in the plant. We're currently also kind of doing some of that modeling to look at um, 
how um, introducing one of these pathways or one of these enzymes will um, affect some of the other enzymes in the whole metabolic um, system. Yeah, that would be like another concern that I had, like uh, a common problem uh, with uh, like introducing a gene uh, into like an organism is often not to get it to express the certain gene, um, but also to keep in check that it's like not filling up to the brim with that uh, uh, enzyme. Uh, enzyme. Um, so yeah, this would also be probably a concern that you have to like tackle. Um, that you you have to make certain that the regulation is really on fleek, especially considering that you're not like your end goal would be not to have like one or a few plants in your laboratory that work, but like it has to work on a large scale field, like multiple thousands about thousands of plants uh, that it reliably does not kill the plant by simply overproducing it. And if you introduce something like uh, the heat inducible expression, etc., I am not sure if it's like beneficial to this actually. Um, because like the more factors you have, like I could imagine, yes, uh, that it would kind of like bind itself uh, like the entire expression already to match how, how much heat there is. But I would also fear or uh, like be worried as a judge whether or not this kind of factor would destabilize the entire um, regulation. So perhaps keep it at least in mind that uh, if it actually factors into um, the expression, like level of expression, that you then have to like consider, okay, perhaps if it's that negative, we either need a, like a proposed solution to it, or we say, okay, it would be nice. And if it doesn't work that way, we just use a stable expression level um, and say, yeah, we just use our models um, to say when, when it's actually needed for our plants and the fields, et cetera, like when the heat waves actually crack in and mm -hmm. then say, okay, um, we are like at least that you're self-aware about this issue and that you have to like work around it. Yeah, that's a good point to think about. Um, something that I would also comment on is how you said that you plan to ultimately use a spray to transpect your plants if I'm getting it correct. Um, do you have a concern about like using something like that? Like I, I imagine like a spray would not be very well controllable. So like, do you have any comments on that? Like how you would sort of control like how you would transpect the plants and like avoid the spray, I guess, from like not being so targeted? Um, yeah, so currently the promoter that we're using um, is only only works in wheat. Um, so it's only heat inducible or only um, drives expression of our system um, when it's in a wheat plant. So I think that's one of the controls that kind of helps us limit some of the spread to um, different crops that's like unneeded. Um, but yeah, currently we're still working on more sort of solidifying some of these biocontainment strategies um, for something like a spray. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point to keep in mind. If there's no other questions, then thank you so much. And um, thank you for all the feedback. It's really great. Okay, so if there are no more questions, please again, reminder to you have the mirror up there. And next team is um, Ajem Wilun Xion. There we go.
you have anyone from Suncheon? I see some of the names there. Okay, so um, until we get any updates from them, we're gonna go now with Ajim to Sally. Thank you. Okay, can you see the full screen? Uh, yes. Yes, okay, so we are Aizen Thessaly, we are from Greece, and uh, for this year, the problem that we will be trying to solve is eutrophication. Uh, eutrophication is a very common problem in water bodies around our area. Um, it starts with uh, over uh, overload of nutrients uh, from agricultural activities in uh, waters like lakes and rivers, and uh, especially phosphorus and nit nitrogen. Um, so this leads to increased uh, algae growth uh, in the in the water, which then blocks uh, sunlight and um, uh, results to oxygen depletion uh, inside the water. Uh, the aquatic organisms die, and uh, these are there are great consequences on uh, humans and animals from that. Um, with uh, our project uh, this year, we will be trying to create a genetically modified uh, organism. It will be a, a modified plant uh, that uh, will be able to detect uh, a, a toxin that is produced by cyanobacteria and specifically the microcystin LR toxin uh, by a synthetic uh, ribosids that we will be engineering. Uh, then as a result uh, of, this, um, uh, of this detection, uh, um, phosphorus transporters will be expressed and uh, will be localized in the membrane of the roots and uh, then uh, phosphates will be soaked up from waters and uh, they, will, they will be transferred to the upper part of uh, plants and it will be stored in inside them. Then we will be able to uh, to crop out the uh, excess uh, plant and uh, use, the, use them as uh, fertilizers because they will be rich in uh, nutrients. Uh, so this is uh, the genetic design uh, of our system. Um, we can see that uh, there is this uh, synthetic ribosuits that will be able to detect the toxin. And as a result, it will lead to mRNA degradation of uh, a protein that uh, if it is present, it will be the, the tar protein that you may be familiar with. So if there is the tar in your system, it will be able to bind to the theta O element in where it is, uh, wherever it is uh, present. And uh, we decided to uh, insert the theta O element in the DNA sequence of uh, the PHT1 phosphorus uh, transporter. So wherever there is the tar, the PHT1 will not be expressed. But uh, if you have a microcystin in the water, uh, the ribosuits will result to degradation of the tar and marine. And so wherever there is uh, the toxin, PST1 will be expressed and uh, result to phosphorus um, uptake. And the uh, experiments that uh, we'll be trying to do this year, some we have already done, are in silico tests of uh, ribosis engineering. Um, and so these were done with uh, some bioinformatic tools or like uh, RNA fold. And uh, they were based on the TPP ribosis that there is already present in some uh, plants. Um, then we will be uh, assembling uh, all of our parts with a golden braid assembly. Um, this, uh, the final plasmids will be used to uh, transform agrobacteria. 
so and and then we will perform uh, agroinfiltration experiments to see uh, if the the proteins, i.e., the PST1, is uh, successfully uh, repressed under the regulatory system that we have inserted. And then, if we have, uh, yeah, if we uh, if uh, we have enough time, we will try and do a hairy root uh, transient uh, expression of proteins. Uh, to see if um, the PST1 can be successfully expressed in uh, actual roots and not only in leaves of plants. And so, yes, this is our project Navanthus for this year. Um, thank you very much for your, your time and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Does anyone have any questions or comments um, for the Thessaly team? Um, sorry about that. Um, so I was wondering, what's your guys' uh, biggest setback in terms of uh, your lab work so far? There's obviously a lot of steps involved. And I'm wondering if you've had any troubles so far. Yeah, first of all, uh, not um, so uh, we, we are in the final step of uh, transforming the agrobacteria to perform the agroinfiltration. And uh, well, the level two cloning uh, of the golden braid, uh, so th this is the final construct. Uh, we, we're just, we can, uh, we can't get the final construct ready, uh, which uh, includes both uh, transcriptional units. And so, yeah, we just uh, would like one more week to, to do that, but uh, the agrofiltration experiments will take more time than that. And uh, of course, after, after performing agroinfiltration, we want to see that uh, the protein has been successfully located to the membrane of the roots, and uh, we'll, we will want to use the confocal microscope for that. And uh, some there are only a handful of people in our uh, laboratory that know how to use it, and uh, we have to kind of like um, uh, uh, follow their program. And if they are out of uh, the laboratory, we won't be able to do it. And they are leaving soon from the university. And maybe this this will be something that uh, will uh, be uh, will be uh, limiting uh, us from. Uh, there, there have not been a lot of uh, setbacks. Um, uh, there has not been uh, there have not been a lot of setbacks just yet, but there is still room for <laughs> a lot of setbacks. Okay, hey, uh, thank you. Um, I guess you guys kind of addressed this, but um, the biocontainment concerns with, in terms of having this sort of system out in the wild, um, have you guys like, 
addressed? Have you guys like been in contact with experts about that? Like, have you planned out uh, how you would yeah. address? That? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, this is especially um, concerning for our project because we were planning on. Uh, well, we not we're not planning in the end. Uh, the uh, early thoughts was that uh, we would be um, trying to release this uh, this modified plant in the environment, of course, in a, a kind of a contained way. We we want to use uh, nets around the plant to uh, to contain the seeds, and uh, we also had to. Uh, to do a similar thing for the roots underneath the water because uh, it also spreads by uh, rhizomes. Um, but we later found out that this just simply wouldn't be enough and that uh, nature always finds its way and you know. Um, so we talked with uh, some experts and uh, they told us about some genes that you can use and uh, they can be specifically uh, um, expressed only in uh, embryos and uh, anthers, uh, like uh, under like the Barnes gene uh, is used a lot under the the regulation of uh, some anther specific uh, promoters, um, and uh, we will be uh, trying to use some of these to see if. Uh, if they are actually functional and uh, we could use them in the future, but uh, nothing like uh, that sort of thing yet. Okay, uh, perhaps I would um, ask two questions in that regard. Um, first of all, um, do you expect this to be applicable on European soil or? on what like let's potentially imagine that uh, every like i mean it's of course in the future so everything works well you have a very nice product that actually kind of uh like it, it is safe more or less at least if you use it in like a specific environment etc cetera, etc cetera. those are the, the this like requiring a lot of specific situations like you have to plan where to use it you have to like confine the area that you want to use it in etc etc to like not uh let the uh, the plants plants lose into the environment how do and this will be a definitely a question for human practice like if if the judges hear this they they will ask this um how do you actually envision the use in the future because i can tell you uh, as someone who has talked uh, to the efsa uh, of europe etc in europe they will rather die than let this happen um <laughs> uh, so uh, unless in the future some somehow uh, this uh, will like way way in the future uh, the entire legislation has changed this like with this kind of uh, biosafety, uh, it will not happen in Europe. So have you an, already a plan or an, like an idea how to make it usable in other countries or I in general? Well, uh, we, we actually have a kind of fun story about uh, trying to find experts on uh, that w w could help us with the, the implementation of our idea. And uh, we came into contact with uh, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and, uh, and Food here in Greece. And uh, once we told them that we were pl planning on uh, not even releasing in the environment, on building uh, a synthetic plant, they tried to uh, they, they tried to get us on the, the telephone and to tell us that this is so illegal they, they if they knew where we were they would send the police mm -hmm. <laughs> so so yeah we know that uh, we are not going for anything like uh, re open releasing the environment 
uh, as we initially thought. So in European uh, areas where the regulation is so strict, uh, it cannot be even discussed. Uh, no, unless unless uh, you uh, unless we um, we design it in a slightly different way for it to be applicable in uh, wastewater treatment plants and not in uh, and not in the actual lake or river where the problem is. Um, there are some facilities uh, here in Thessaly that uh, that uh, that uh, treat uh, wastewater. And we have come into contact with some of them to tell us uh, more about uh, if we could uh, implement there. And um, they have been uh, reasonably, uh, uh, no, what was the leak? Yes, sir. It's me, it's me. They said that, yeah, in the future it could work. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, 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 this is something that we must um, really develop in our human practices uh, aspect, like where this would be actually be uh, implemented and maybe in uh, other countries, but uh, we have not uh, really uh, talked about any expert in that, like outside of European Union. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so, so for, for, for you as an um, advice, I would definitely, if you uh, plan on something uh, like actually using it within the century, um, <laughs> uh, that you might actually search for other areas and judges will very much li uh, love it if they see that you like, try to think a little bit outside the box like where is an area that um, might be interested into this and is also like in in a way um like it, the best i like the best scenario would be if you found someone like uh, who's working more or less in the industry and like is from another area than europe because again in europe it will not happen um <laughs> And he says, or she says, yeah, this is something that would, at least in theory, with like certain ideas, etc. So basically, this integrated human practice aspect, this would be awesome in, if we had it. Unless you find something like this, I am worried that the judges will destroy you on this area. Um, they have like that's that's a core feature of hp and from what from my experience they uh, are very persistent if like that doesn't really uh, work out in the end and has like no real future no matter how cool the actual project is it will get a lot of minus points okay. it's just like my my little uh, advice for you uh, so, like, in what direction you might actually try to work at in human practice or integrated human practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. It looks like we have a big hole to fill for the future. Yeah, thanks. No problem. The next team in our lineup is ASU IGEM, and since I'm a member of ASU IGEM, I'm going to go ahead and present our pitch. Um, so, can everybody see the slide, please? Are we good? So, yes? Okay. Um, so our project this year is called Clamidomonas, and it's an algal bioremediation system. So we are taking um, a microalgae and using it um, for bioremediation, specifically to take arsenic out of contaminated water. Um, so let me go over an overview of our project. So the state we live in in the U.S. is Arizona, and Arizona faces um, historical contamination um, in groundwater sources with arsenic. 
Um, and this is an issue that's especially prevalent in rural areas um, without access to proper running water. Um, so they face, um, they're often forced to drink these water sources which are contaminated or they have to drive miles in order to access clean water sources that aren't contaminated with arsenic. So we wanted to sort of tackle this problem um, in our project. Um, so you can imagine that drinking arsenic contaminated water has a lot of negative health impacts and it does. And it's not even just acute exposures. It actually, there can be severe health, um, negative health effects just from drinking um, mildly contaminated water over a long period of time. And so this is why it's an important um, issue for us to look at because we don't want our communities to be drinking contaminated water and facing negative health impacts as a result. So this is why we're engineering a solution to this problem with a microalgae called the Chlamydomonas reincardii. Um, it's a pretty widely used chassis in the iDrum competition in terms of phototrophic organisms, but it's still not obviously as um, widespread as E. coli or yeast, but um, it does have a quite a big community in terms of symbio and phototrophs. Um, but yes, it's a unicellular eukaryotic phototroph. Um, and it has a widespread history being used in genetic engineering. Um, but what we're doing with um, Chlamydomonas and Brain Hardy Eye is engineering it to sort of have a greater capacity to uptake heavy metals, specifically arsenic from water. Um, so if we think about Chlamydomonas Brain Hardy Eye, it already has um, a predisposition to sort of be able to take up heavy metals from water. So what we're thinking of doing is taking its innate abilities and sort of enhancing them um, by introducing these two genes. So ACR2P is arsenate reductase and it's an enzyme which reduces arsenate to arsenite um, in the clammy cell. And I'll go over the details of this later, but arsenate and arsenite are the two common most two most common oxidation states that exist in contaminated water. And by reducing arsenate to arsenite, we sort of enable this arsenic to be sequestered in, and uptaken into the cell. And the second gene we're introducing is phytochelatin synthase, which is a enzyme that um, produces, helps to produce phytochelatins, which are metal binding peptides that bind to arsenic and sort of allow it to be uptaken in the vacuole. And again, I'll go over this in a schematic. Um, so here's the schematic of what our biological pathway is aiming to be. And so in water, so if you have clammy and you put it in water um, and you have contaminated water, you'll have arsenic in the water that exists in two oxidation states, arsenate and arsenite. And this arsenate and arsenite is going to come into the cell. Um, but the problem is we ultimately want to sequester this arsenate into the clammy cell and have it stay there. And there is an existing pathway in a clammy cell, in clammy already, um, whereby the arsen whereby arsenite can be complex with phytochelatins and uptaken into the vacuole. So there, therefore, this enables the arsenate arsenite to complex and be uptaken um, into the clammy cell and simply sequestered there. Um, but again, this can only take place if the arsenic is in the three plus oxidation state or as arsenite. So we're combating this problem um, by impl implementing the arsenate reductase as mentioned previously. So we'll have the arsenate come into the cell and it'll get reduced into arsenite, which is the form that can only be um, complex with the phytochelatin peptides. And so once we have all the arsenic in the form of arsenite, it's going to get complex with the phytochelatins and taken up into the vacuole. So basically in a nutshell, we're taking all the arsenic that comes into the cell, transforming it into the form that can be bound to the phytochelatin. And then that phytochelatin arsenite complex will be taken up into the vacuole. And this will enable clammy to take all of the arsenic, hopefully out of the water um, to a greater efficiency than a normal unengineered clammy can do. Um, so let me just go over briefly our construct design so you know what we did in order to accomplish this. So we implemented um, our constructs and we created them by using the MoClo assembly standard. So all of these parts are from the MoClo kit, except a few that we designed ourselves specific to our project. And this enables um, um, easy switching of parts and reassembly of our constructs when needed. 
So we have our promoter and five prime UTR and three prime UTR and terminator as normal. And then of course we have our phytochelatin synthase gene, our ACR2P gene and a antibiotic resistance gene. In between these three genes, um, we have two 2A peptides and these 2A peptides are um, enable independent transcripts of each of these genes to be created. So what happens is when a ribosome, um, once this, once this um, construct becomes transcribed and a ribosome comes along to translate this transcript, when it comes across the sequence for the 2A peptide, it will induce what is called a ribosomal skip event. So the ribosome will skip and it'll help create independent, um, um, independent translations and independent proteins of each of these genes. So it, effectively, this will enable us to in, integrate multiple transgenes in, in a single unit here. And this is sort of unique in the clammy field because we've had um, historic issues um, implementing multiple genes in clammy. Um, and by doing this and by using these two peptides, we can sort of expand um, our capacity for engineering clammy. And something interesting here is that historically creating these sort of like condensed transcriptional units in which there are many genes under the control of the same promoter and terminator has been difficult because you would need these two a peptides in order to create those independent transcripts. But this FMDV peptide is the only two a peptide which has been truly very well characterized in clammy and shown to work. This one you see here, the TAV peptide is one that's quite experimental and which is why our project would be sort of novel because we're using two 2A, two 2A peptides, but one of them that hasn't been well characterized and shown to work well in clammy. So this is why by showing that this 2A peptide would work, our project would be um, advancing the clammy field because then we can show, okay, we can use other 2A peptides other than this single one to enable multiple genes to be put in an independent transcript. Um, and so this is why our project could sort of on the offside, in addition to our initial goal of like creating this bioremediation system, enable the clammy community to sort of gain something from it as well. Um, and in addition, other than these two peptides, we sort of have tags as well to sort of later confirm that um, the proteins that we initially enabled it, that we initially aimed to produce actually were produced. Um, now let's get on to implementation of our project and how we actually aim to implement um, it because that is very important for any iGEM project. So before even thinking about our solution, we had to think about a lot of things because um, we were aiming to sort of integrate our algae into a filter system. So we aim to design a filter that would effectively house our algae and allow groundwater to be filtered through it and at the same time be safe. So we had to think about the time, the, the time it took for our algae to grow, which is definitely longer than any other cells like E. coli, and also the time in which it actually took for the algae to uptake the arsenic out of the water and the efficiency of this and also biocontainment as we've been talking about this whole time, and also the size and the feasibility of whatever filter we plan to build, and also how we would manage um, dealing with the algae which had uptaken the arsenic out of water. Because if you imagine, if you have algae that uptake arsenic out of water, you don't want to just put that algae with arsenic in it anywhere. You need to come up with a plan with how you're going to deal with that in the end. So this is one of the initial filter designs we came up with and you can see it's really convoluted and looks kind of unattainable and to be honest it is. So this filtration system that we initially designed would totally like solve the every issue we came up with in this previous slide in the previous slide about the growth time um and dealing with the waste and all of this. But the big problem with this sort of solution that takes into account every possible factor is that it's extremely costly and it's kind of big and bulky. And the communities which we're trying to implement this solution in simply do not have the resources to even have running water 
And so how, and oftentimes face issues acquiring their basic needs. So how can we expect them to implement a filter which is like this? And in addition, like in order to grow our clammy, we need to put it in media with many different chemicals. And oftentimes the, the cost of upkeeping the system and the chemicals themselves are more expensive than simply buying bottled water. So this can't be a feasible solution having this filter like that. And as a team, we sort of recognize that. Um, but anyways, we did end up creating like a CAD model of what this system could look like anyway, um, just as a theoretical high-tech solution to the problem if cost wasn't a factor and if all of this wasn't a factor. But I wanted to mention outside of this, in which we don't have this in our slide, that we, in addition to this high-tech solution, this high-cost solution, this unfeasible solution, we did come up with a low-tech solution in which the water would not be filtered for people, but rather livestock. Um, and that filtration system that we came up with is incredibly low-tech, essentially just a ditch that you would dig and you would put your algae in. And it's a little bit like slightly more complicated than that, but in simple terms, um, we aim to like have a very low tech solution for filtering water for livestock. And the logic behind that is that um, when you have livestock that are eating crops watered with arsenic contaminated water, you can sort of, as you move up the food chain, sort of, um, cause some con concentration of arsenic and eventually when um, the humans actually eat livestock which have been sort of eating these crops watered um, with arsenic contaminated water that actually can pose a very significant exposure to arsenic similar or even greater to than just drinking the water so then by watering crops and also allowing um, the livestock to drink water, which has been filtered, we can sort of solve that solution, solve that problem a little bit more indirectly and a little bit more feasibly too. So in addition to this filtration system, we've also pursued various human practices portions of our project. Um, and in order to combat the widespread arsenic contamination in our state. So we gained insight from talking to many different professors at ASU and also experts in industry who has given us insights about how to approach filtration and how to approach biosafety. And a lot of these ideas and problems that I talked about actually came from them. And we toured like um, al algal bioremediation facilities at our university and places where they were growing algae to see like how it happened and what parts of these we can, these processes we could implement in our project perhaps. Aside from this, we've obviously been having a few collaborations such as this one right now and writing articles um, sort of to spread the word about this problem that exists in our state. And also um, we are hosting also a conference on water quality issues to sort of further um, bring this issue to, to light and hosting a podcast with another um, iGEM team about synthetic biology and water quality issues, again, to sort of spread the word about this issue. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for listening to this presentation. Hi, uh, I have a few questions if you're open to them. Yep. Um, I, I'm not sure if you covered this and I just missed it, but where exactly do you plan to implement this? Like, cause we talked about a lot about like the filters and stuff, but like, cause obviously, you know, arsenic isn't evenly distributed around the world. And, you know, it's especially like over in Africa cause you know, Westerners kind of uh, implemented all of these like mines in Africa, specifically arsenic mines, as well as just mining for their byproducts. But, you know, America isn't the only place and like, I guess, where do you really plan on implementing this? I guess like initially and still today, we plan this to be only, I guess we only propose this as a solution for our state and specifically to the rural populations in our state. I guess because we are trying to focus on a local problem rather, rather than trying to like tackle a global issue. 
even though arsenic contamination is a prevalent issue in other areas of the world, we're trying to keep this problem focused on a local scale. Um, and we plan to implement this in areas which are most affected by arsenic contamination in our state, as in like the rural people who, who rely on groundwater sources. Um, I guess, yeah, so yeah, I understand that this is a global problem, but we were only focusing on the local aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I totally get like, yeah, that's a, that's absolutely spectacular. Like obviously because that is a local issue. I am wondering though, um, because I know uh, the United States historically was really big on using, you know, arsenic wallpaper and arsenic, you know, colorings. And in a lot of those rural communities, like that's a huge source of like arsenic poisoning. So I'm wondering if there's any studies that actually look into whether it is from like groundwater, like you say, or whether it's from other sources. Um, so it can be from arsenic contamination can come from many sources, but the reason why a lot of the arsenic, a lot of the water supply in many of these rural regions are affected is because there's a history of mining in these areas. So rural populations in rural areas in the past, there was a lot of um, mining in these areas for uranium. Um, so during like the Cold War time. And so there would be an extensive mining activity in these regions. And now there's abandoned mines still to this day and some mining activity that still exists. And so all of this has led to like increased like concentrations of heavy metals and contaminants and arsenic and even like uranium in the water. And so like in these rural areas, that's where I feel like most of the contamination probably comes from. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were to put your organisms in like a, like one of these source of water with, would they be able to survive like the other heavy metals and other things that are commonly co-occurring with this arsenic? Um, you mean with the other like things present in the water, like perhaps like kill our organisms? Yeah. Um, I think we, well, we haven't tested it, but for in regards to like the other heavy metals in addition to arsenic, so clammy has been shown to like unengineered have like resistance and be able to uptake heavy metals from water. Um, so I don't think the presence of these of heavy metals, like for example, like cadmium or something like this could kill clammy, but it could definitely impact its growth perhaps, which we would have to take in con into consideration if we were designing any sort of filtration system. Um, and also, I guess like it, the consideration that yes, um, like we can't consider a theoretical situation in which only arsenic ex exists in the water because in reality, like a lot of other things exist in the water. So like the presence of other heavy metals could like interfere with the efficiency of our pathway. So we do have to consider that, but I don't think we have to consider the like possibility of our clammy dying in the water. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, awesome. And just one more question for you and then I just have some general feedback. Um, oh goodness, I've lost it. Uh, I'll give space for someone else to ask questions while I remember what I was going to ask. Uh, sure, I can, I can jump in if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, I add another bunch of questions. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, just run that two questions. Um, first question is regarding your filtration system. So it, it's rather a basic component, which I'm not sure if it's like taken into account yet. Because unlike, for example, E. coli, uh, who can just like be thrown into a huge uh, tank and just let the bacteria do bacteria things, you have to keep in mind that you're working with a phototrophic organism. So at a certain point, you are getting limited in scale because of the sunlight or like general, just light, I guess. If I'm like, I, I don't work with clammy or whatever. So I really don't know in what scale this is like actually, or at what point this has an impact, etc. But I doubt that you can just like use a normal tank and close the lid. 
Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure. Have you thought about this, or like uh, it, it is is it even a considerable factor in all of this? Yeah, we thought about that. So you can like our initial like schematic design is not very representative of like what the CAD design actually looked like because you can see this does look like a giant tank. But like in this like final CAD design, you can see it's like sort of resembling like what industrial photobioreactors are kind of like today. So it's like a tubular photobioreactor in which like the walls of the container are oops, the walls of the container are like rather thin. So the sunlight can penetrate through. But again, like this is like expensive. So that's why in our other like low tech proposal, like we aim to have it like like a pool. And this would be similar in, to to like raceway ponds that exist in like in like um, industrial systems which grow algae on a long on a large scale. A lot of people do use like raceway ponds because they are quite cheap in comparison to like these tubular photobioreactors. So like we did think about like all of the like growth considerations, but again like cost is always a factor. Involved in these things. Yeah. Are these pools uh, open? Yeah, okay, they're they're open, but then you can also put a net over them. Like when we visited like this um this department in our university, like called Ask Caddy, which does a lot of algae work, we saw one of these ponds which had like a net over it, which is like a possibility, but honestly that's like kind of crude, but like it's like okay, like you can do that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in this case, I would I would be less worried about biocontainment in regards of uh, like keeping the clammy in the water because I doubt that it gets legs and walks away. Um, it's rather an issue of like keeping any animal or anything that's interested in eating a plant <laughs> uh, from eating your arsenic uh, um, algae and basically carrying it uh, into the food chain. Which br basically brings me to the next question that I had. Um, it's, it's my last uh, in that regard. Um, now, let's consider you, in the end, you have a very nice filter system, you, everything works. You are still end up with a chunk of biomass that is highly toxic. Um, and... Uh, I'm not sure, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that there is a way to work with that. Um, it's rather a question like how, um, like, what do you actually do with the biomass in the end? Because I would be worried, uh, like, if you just, like, throw it into the backyard, some worm will eat the arsenic biomass, which would be also bad. So how do you handle the waste? I have just a quick, um, sorry, comment to attach on to finish question, because that was also very related to what I was curious about, because I do know that once uh, arsenic is like bound within an organic compound, it's not actually that, you know, detrimental to our health. And it's actually, you know, quite safe. So yeah, that's just a comment to add on to that question. Mm, so I know that like, if this arsenic is bound and like hopefully contained in the clammy cell, then like it has some form of containment, but I still think like it would need to be treated like as it was like toxic material because like it is. Um, but there exists in the US, like our team was looking into like how hazardous waste is managed by businesses. And so like there are people, so like if you keep your hazardous waste and you like contain it in containers there are like people which can which come and pick it up and deal with it properly like in our state but I don't know if this would be like a feasible solution or something that is that is like I guess fair to ask of communities like for example if you had like the toxic claim you arsenic waste in the end and then you ask like for example like a community member like okay like take the tank of arsenic tiny waste and like keep it somewhere until like somebody can pick it up. I don't know if it's fair to like ask these communities to deal with this waste at all 
for to possibly like leave these containers of waste to maybe be like taken or misused or maybe like broken open by somebody like that's always something to consider um but i don't know if that like sufficiently like answers or solves the question of like how it would be deal with dealt with because that is like still kind of like not very satisfying answer uh then i would just propose something i i would think and suggest that this very question um is something that you could just address in like an integrated human practice work you basically uh, just seek out um, someone who's like involved in this or like especially of course in the area you want to work in um in the logistics or basically just like how do like a company or i don't know in what kind of service uh, is responsible for that um how do they they actually like work with this kind of waste and plainly ask them what do you think how how would that uh, work out perhaps like just in a very basic in, uh, interview or like that would be the very cool stuff or like just as an email would already be very, very nice especially considering that if you have this as a good answer like if you have this answer fleshed out you can like let uh, let the judges know that you uh, basically had have done the research etc which will lead them to ask some further questions in that regard because they will be interested in that so it's it's not only a like a safety net should they ask the question it's also something that will give you bonus points if you've actually fleshed it out and can showcase yeah we have done our homework um even beyond what our project currently is like just just like the very technical stuff but like how it would actually work in the end i think that would be appreciated by the judges okay, thank you. I do have another question. Have you guys looked at, um, in, like, instead of an actual filter, um, if you have looked into uh, kind of putting these guys into the um, water filtration systems that are already implemented by the city and like uh, like uh, water processing stations? Yeah, I guess like we we haven't super considered that, like, I guess just because like the areas that we were thinking about targeting like are quite remote and so like they're not connected to like the municipal like water systems anyways and so like if any water was produced it would somehow have to be like trucked or something to these communities which i guess like is an option but it is kind of like presents like a challenge for us to like take advantage of like what already exists in like see So wait, the areas you're looking to target don't have running water? A lot of people don't have running water and they rely on like groundwater, like from wells, like pumping from wells. And so like this would be like a main issue, like regarding like using any like system connected to a city. But I guess like these areas are like too far away from those resources. Interesting. And um, one final question. Uh, so, you know, theoretically, if everything works out, do you guys have any estimates of, you know, how long it would actually take for your organisms to actually uptake and sequester that arsenic? Like whether you're going to have to filter this water for, you know, minutes to hours to days to... Yeah, that's why we aim to have it like we designed it such that it would be like a batch process because it would take like kind of a while for like the water to be filtered by the algae. So we were going to like close off like whatever like photobiorics or like filtration unit we had and then like let the algae like filter the water and then like offload the filtered water um, to be like drunk by people. Um, but I guess like it would take much longer than like traditional filters might for like actually dealing with the water and taking out the contaminants. Um, 
but we haven't yet done like the modeling for that. So like, I wouldn't be able to give you like an estimate in the amount of time that it would take, but I know that we were dealing with it by not having it be a continuous process because that wouldn't make sense. We are gonna have it be a, like a batch process. Um, so uh, thank you so much for uh, all these feedback questions uh, for ASU, but due to time constraints, uh, we might want to move on to Hopkins. We have kept them waiting for quite a while. So if there's nothing else, uh, Hopkins is ready. Move on to them. Yep. Give us a second to pull up these slides. That's good. Perfect. All righty. Is the screen share coming through? Sweet. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, we are Team Hopkins, Hopkins iGEM. Um, this is our second year doing the iGEM competition. Um, and this year, we decided to uh, look into a really interesting and um, unique problem that is basically looking at how can we enable plants to grow in microgravity and space flight. Um, so there's some existing limitations that are stopping plants from um, being able to grow in, say, in orbit or in spaceflight, or generally just in microgravity. And uh, most notably, that is the absence of gravitational cues. So uh, obviously, on Earth, we have the force to do gravity. Um, and uh, when stems and leaves are growing, they can grow against um, the force of gravity. Um, and the roots can grow in the direction of gravity. And that allows plants to find nutrients and uh, grow pretty efficiently. Um, but in space, um, you lose those gravitropic cues. While stems are generally not terribly hindered, um, they can grow towards light sources pretty well. Um, the absence of the microgravity cues, uh, sorry, make it, the absence of the gravity cues uh, makes it so that when roots are growing, they grow pretty disoriented. They sometimes grow in these really tight coils. Um, and generally, plants that are grown in space have uh, diminished volume um, and diminished root mass when compared to plants grown on Earth. Um, if you can take a look at the figures on the right, um, there's actually a paper that looked into um, how seedlings grew when um, they were actually either completely on Earth or um, during part of their growth in space flight. You can see that these roots grew pretty disoriented um, during the part that they were actually in uh, microgravity. So um, obviously, this all translates into lost calories and uh, longer times to grow food for astronauts. Um, so if we ever become more interested as you know, humans in exploring more of what space um, is around us, um, and, you know, looking more into the final frontier, this is probably something that um, some issue that we have to overcome. So a bit of background on how uh, normal sort of um, gravitropism works in um, roots. Specifically, this is the, um, I'm gonna be talking about how it works in Arabidopsis thalania, which is our model organism, um, but it's decently similar in other organisms as well. Um, essentially, you have these large, um, very massive plastids um, or starch containing organelles called statolids. Um, these are so heavy that they sink in the direction of gravity or direction of the force due to gravity um, within the cells of this zone of the root tip called the uh, meristem region. Um, and these specific cells are called columella cells. Um, so within these columella cells, the stylet sinking um, causes sort of this shift in the intracellular kind of location of these auxin carriers. Um, the auxin carriers that are usually of this pin protein family um, loosely associate with either the um, internal wall, internal side of the cell membrane or on the outer wall of the statolith. Um, so when the statoliths move, the intercellular distribution of these auxin carriers also moves. Um, and these changes happening um, within every single cell of um, every single columella cell in the meristem region causes an overall shift in the um, distribution of these auxin care of auxin hormones within the entire root tip. So um, auxin carriers being the 
uh, proteins that are manipulated when the um, stylets move, and auxins being these really small plant hormones that usually circulate throughout the root tip. So the direction and sort of um, convergence, a lot of the circulation shifts. Um, and this is interesting because um, auxins are responsible for um, basically regulating the um, extension, elongation of plant cells. And so the shift basically means that um, on the side of the root that is farther, if that makes sense, from the force to the gravity, there is more elongation. And on the side of the um, root tip that's say closer to the force of the gravity, there's less elongation. So the entire root tip kind of steers in that direction. Um, so obviously these cues are absent in space. And um, what we thought would be the most direct and most sort of biomimetic way to tackle this problem in space is to replace the gravitropism with uh, magnetotropism. Um, so essentially what that would involve is uh, making these satellites, um, these organelles magnetic, uh, by overexpressing uh, magnetoferritin within them. Um, this is kind of makes it so that the pro our project is split up kind of neatly into um, a wet lab and a hardware project. The wet lab team uh, will be most responsible for um, gaining Arabidopsis to overexpress ferritin within these organelles of the root tip. And the hardware team is responsible for creating a gradient magnetic field um, that can pull down these organelles. So um, the way you generate a gradient magnetic field is using a pair of Helmholtz coils. Um, you run a small current through one coil and a very large current through the other. And this creates a very strong gradient magnetic field between the two coils. Um, since interestingly enough, the force due to magnetic field isn't dependent on the strength of the magnetic field. It's dependent on the gradient strength of the magnetic field. Um, doing it this way allows us to create really strong sort of homogenous-ish um, gradient magnetic field and basically uh, makes it so that the force due to magnetic field extends straight down for the plant, um, which is generally pretty helpful. So um, the wet lab team, um, we have had some progress so far. Um, we are using type 2S assembly this year um, since we had pretty, um, a pretty difficult time trying to get Gibson assembly to work last year since we're pretty much a new team, um, this being the second year we're doing the competition. Um, and in other projects, members of our team have had success using um, type 2S based assembly. So we just uh, decided to use that. Um, the, we're basically assembling in three separate genes. The first gene is a pyrococcus furiosus ferritin expression gene. Um, we're using a promoter that's specific to the root meristem region. Um, and then also using a transpeptide that's specific for amyloplasts. So we hope for that um, with those two criteria in mind, um, we hope that all of the columella cells will be um, containing some sort of ferritin within the, uh, or no, containing our ferritin within the uh, satellites. Um, we're also using a couple selection markers, uh, Ruby and Eumycin phosphotransferase. Uh, Ruby is, um, in, is basically uh, a small um, coding script cassette for the multiple different enzymes that are involved in making betanin. Um, betanin is the pigment that makes beetroots that really dark red. Um, and so it's a really useful visual marker for seeing if something's been successfully transformed. Um, and the real way it becomes especially useful um, since we're using Arabidopsis, um, we're going to do a floral dip and then harvest seeds. All the seeds that should be positive for Ruby are going to have a red seed coat, so that makes it really easy. Um, neomycin phosphotransferase confers resistance to canamycin and neomycin, so that's just for negative selection, um, the antibiotic resistance. So we have some experiments planned. Um, these haven't got along yet since we've had some uh, difficulties trying to get um, our plants grown. Um, but um, we have, we're getting some help from the Applied Physics Lab at JHU, which is uh, in another city, but they're actually willing to help us and grow some plants for us, um, grow some air balances for us. So we can um, test out um, our construct and do some transformation on it. Um, there's also a concern whether, um, you know, since, since we're trying to overexpress an iron 
um, overexpress an iron storage protein for ferritin. Um, we have to give it enough iron for, um, we, basically in order for the ferritin to be um, sufficiently magnetic, we need to have a large enough iron source um, uh, for, for the plant. Otherwise the, the, um, the ferritin won't be loaded with iron. But the issue that we might run into is that um, the level of iron required to efficiently load all the ferritin might be beyond the plant's um, you know, natural iron tolerance. And so that's kind of a problem. Um, there's a couple suggested mechanisms for how this iron tolerance works, as in excess iron can cause um, things like reactive oxygen species generation, which is sort of a problem. Um, so we're looking into whether, um, we're, we're going to test out whether um, we can grow seedlings on different concentrations of iron containing media and kind of see where the limit lies and then just use that in our, um, in our future sort of experiments that are trying to load ferritin with iron. Um, but um, in case we still can't get the ferritin to load with the maximum possible concentration of iron, we'll have to look into things like expressing um, antioxidant genes um, that confer resistance to um, you know, iron toxicity and such. Um, and here's a bit, a uh, couple pictures about uh, how stuff is coming along. Unfortunately, I think these plants are dead. Um, you can see, <laughs> Um, yeah, you can see a very small sort of sprout in that corner there. Um, that was, I think that's the last we saw of that one. Um, the, the applied physics lab is really just helping us grow plants because we've been unsuccessful. Um, it might be related to the humidity conditions that they were in since uh, that wasn't, we were trying to grow them inside a humidome, but I don't think the humidity was very well controlled inside that humidome because it might have been too large. Um, but. In any other case, um, our DNA assembly is coming along quite well. Um, we finished um, basically our level alpha assembly, um, and then we're going to do a level omega assembly following that. Um, we're technically doing a type 2 assembly strategy that's kind of a mix of both uh, Moclo and Golden Braid, but we decided to use the Golden Braid terminology. Um, I forget exactly why, but we're deciding to use the Golden Braid terminology. Uh, but um, we're just waiting for um, the university to give us uh, basically our budget allocation and we'll be able to send all of our level alpha samples for sequencing to confirm that they've been assembled well. Um, but yeah, what follows is assembling it into an agrobacterium binary vector um, of the PLX series, which we actually purchased and have got um, in the lab. Uh, we're just going to see that how it comes along. So um, this is the first of our jar lab work. Um, so because we're introducing a new ferritin into the statolith, um, and we also just based on literature review, realized that the native ferritin um, in Arabidopsis is also in the statolith, we wanted to see how it would interact. Um, and basically this alpha fold model just shows that um, docking is possible, uh, which is something that we kept in cons consideration when we were trying to design um, our kinetics experiments, because this might just affect the activity of iron binding, which is like the main kinetic thing that we're planning to investigate. Yeah, so for the iron loading model, um, as we mentioned in the wet lab portion, um, too high of an iron concentration will have adverse effects, but then too low um, will have not enough of a magnetic effect. So um, once we've sort of determined those concentrations through experimentation, we're planning to make a model that sort of mirrors a pharmacokinetic model, but instead of a therapeutic window, um, there would be sort of a window of activity. And based on that, we're planning to determine how to implement um, the iron dosing sort of of the plants um, and determine if we need like to have an ideal initial concentration or dosing schedule to maintain the concentration in that uh, desired concentration window. 
Um, Lucas from our team also did some mathematics to kind of determine what the actual gradient magnetic field strength we needed to move ferritin particles within plant cells. Um, so we saw some previous literature that saw the satellite response time is usually on the order of 30 minutes. Um, and so we're like, okay, then that means we have to be able to move our magnetic satellites um, from one end of the cell to the other within 30 minutes. Um, and so there was a lot of different parameters included in this, um, including the magnetic susceptibility of um, completely loaded ferritin, um, the hydrodynamic drag inside a cell, which we assumed is roughly equivalent to water, um, and some other parameters that, um, dependent, that are dependent on the number of uh, the number of turns, the uh, diameter of our coils, distance between them, and so on and so forth. Um, and so basically by um, iteratively guessing and checking different parameters, we ended up with a really good combination um, of stuff that was pretty feasible. Um, but the important thing to see here is that this is the plot, this is a plot of the magnetic force uh, between our coils. Um, and you can see in this, between this axis right here and this first line right here, it's roughly constant. But once you're outside the coils on either side, it diminishes quickly. So this kind of told us that if we were ever to um, make some sort of magnetic growth chamber, um, the plants would have to be totally contained within it. Um, otherwise, they just wouldn't experience the constant force due to magnetic field that we want to create. So uh, basically taking Lucas's um, calculated um, values for the current and number of turns of the coils that we needed, um, I took that, I said, okay, I have a current, I have a resistance, that's awesome. Now I can create a constant current driver that will basically create the desired um, magnetic field. So essentially in the coil with the higher current, we found that it has to be basically around 10 amps. And then in the uh, coil with the uh, lower current, it has to be around one amp. Um, and so uh, this is a genetic engineering conference, not an electrical engineering conference. I, I completely understand that. Um, so I'll briefly summarize this, uh, but the important things are, is we used circuit lab to simulate uh, the circuit um, for DC performance. And we're basically um, trying to fine tune the amount of current going through um, this load, which is our coil, um, with a single um, rheostat, which is an adjustable resistor. And so basically by having a small current go through the rheostat, um, it's, um, its gain is being multiplied through this high gain Darlington transistor and then this high current transistor so that we can basically control the larger current with the smaller current. That is kind of what's happening here. Um, and there's also some very key assumptions we made um, in this design as well. Uh, the entire thing is also powered off of five volts, which makes it quite convenient. And so uh, just to summarize the sort of electrical design things, um, in order to modify that current, we're using um, a rheostat that's controllable over I squared C and a lot of other I squared C controllable devices. I squared C is inter-integrated circuit. It's basically a, uh, a serial communication protocol that's super easy to use if you have an Arduino. Um, that's pretty much what we're doing. Um, the other part of the entire um, hardware design, if you recall, um, is, um, oh, perhaps I haven't explained this yet. Um, so in order to simulate microgravity, um, th that's obviously something we can't do um, for our project. Like we can't send a, we can't send plants to the International Space Station. That's not gonna happen. Not within our budget. Not within the budget. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the only other way to simulate microgravity is basically to constantly rotate it. Um, so if you have a sample inside of this random positioning machine, also called a clinostat, uh, you can average the force due to gravity um, just by continuously rotating it. Yeah. Yeah. So on the uh, uh, the clinostat, and uh, so the reason why you see the two circles, those are the housing for the coils. So we decided to. Um, since we're uh, using the, uh, uh, we're turning on the magnetotropic cues, like while we're supposed to do that while the plant is experiencing microgravity, uh, we, we basically integrated two the, the two devices into one housing, and uh, that will make our experiments easier. 
And then how, how, how is, this is a 2D clown stand. Like maybe easier if I use like maybe my phone as a demonstration, uh, how the microgravity micro works. So like uh, normally in, in like uh, earth gravity, like up is up, down is down. But if you like flip for a phone, then the up goes down, the down goes up and it keeps flipping it. And then the plan will just be confused about which way is up, which way uh, it's down. So uh, the average effect is that the staphylids will stay in the middle of the cell and they don't will not move uh, due to gravitational pulls. Yeah. yeah, so that's essentially how we simulate microgravity. And then the coils are there to simulate, um, to make the gradient magnetic field. So if our plants grow, um, our engineered plants grow the right way when we put this inside this device, that would effectively show that if we actually tested out magnetotropism, unlike the ISS, that could actually work. This is all essentially part of that proof of concept. So as part of our human practices, there's a few things that we need to consider. Um, it has been a bit of an uphill battle, so to say, with finding good information, good context to talk about the various problems. So the main, three main things that we focused on were the energy costs as well as um, the possible effect on the environment, um, food health and nutrition, agricultural biotech ethics and policy. And so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is food health and nutrition. And so since our, goal, our overall goal is to, I guess, one day be able to grow like actual plants in space. And so um, there are studies that show that having fresh fruit is healthier than having freeze-dried variants or having food that's just there to get, um, just to have something to consume. And it could, there's also been studies that show more greenery, more um, shrubs and that trees and that kinds of thing, improve the mental health as well as the air quality of a specific place. And so, there's that thing to consider. And so energy costs, um, like our hardware team mentioned, the current energy cost for this is pretty low. However, we'd have to consider the extra cost in taking the um, climate and everything that you would need to grow it at a large enough scale. So that would definitely be something that we are looking into evaluating. However, um, the intersection between space science um, agriculture and like basic plant science is there's very little overlap between those three fields. So what we have been mostly using to try to evaluate the um, human practices aspect of our project have been studies, but um, we are trying to find people that we can actually talk to and stakeholders as well. And for agricultural biotech, um, ethics and policy, we have found that since most of the things that we would theoretically be growing are going to be grown in a confined lab space where there is little chance of cross exposure with either um, earth-based plants, there is little risk of something possibly becoming an invasive species. And um, so, we are trying to evaluate possible impacts on agricultural biotech, but we haven't been able to find anything conclusive yet. So for education, um, there are three main things that we have been working on. One is a video series collaboration to teach SYN biomethods. Um, one thing that we found is that when people are in a lab or they're just starting out with biology, a lot of the time you just go through the methods, you don't really know what you're doing. You're kind of scared to ask whoever you're working under, how does this work? Because sometimes they just expect you to know it or you're just like scared to ask them. And so our target audience would be high school and college students interested in being involved in sin bio research. Maybe they're a little lost about what exactly they're doing or there's just so much information about 
different methods and it's hard to find something that applies to exactly what you're doing. And so we're working on making a video series to target that. And we're also working on a collaboration with William Mary iGem and East Coast Bio Crew as well. All right, I think that concludes our presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions for us, we can definitely answer them. Yes. Question, can you go back to like your simulation? Oh, oops, sorry. Could you go back to like your simulation on alpha fold? Because I wanted like some clarification. Alpha fold, that's right, alpha fold, oh yeah. Um, there you're trying to model like how two different proteins would bind, right? Yeah. I don't from from what I think, alpha fold is only like built for like modeling the folding of like singular proteins, right? Like modeling like the interactions of like different proteins is kind of experimental in the tool, right? Still. Yeah. So like, are you concerned about like how realistic this prediction might be if the tool wasn't actually designed to like show like the, the, the interaction of different foldings, but only the interaction of different proteins, I guess, or cause since it was only designed to like show like how singular proteins would fold. Yeah, so this was mostly um, like a tool we just used for a preliminary um, investigation of if it would be possible for um, the native ferritin to bind to the introduced ferritin at all. Um, and because the native ferritin's concentration is also expected to be much lower, um, we're not expecting this to have any results. Um, this is just the main computational way we investigated how um, if our wet lab results seem to deviate from the trends of our kinetic model, this might contribute to it. Um, this is also partly because even though the native ferritin concentration is much lower, it does increase as iron concentration increases. So it's just something that we're considering, but we don't think that this will necessarily happen for sure. And we also don't think it'll have, um, like it might, it is very likely to have a negligible result. Hey, so um, I was just curious if you guys have um, taken into account like some of the effects you might see, like if your plants are say actually go and stay Sunday, obviously, you know, budget be damned. But um, because I do know that NASA was looking into something kind of similar and they noticed a lot of uh, effects in gene expression to do with a plant's immune system once in space. And I know that I'm not a botanist by any means, but I know that iron definitely plays a role in a plant's immune system. Like too much iron triggers some certain immune stresses or too little also triggers immune stresses. Have you considered at all how that might play into anything? Um, no, I don't think we have. Um, I actually was not familiar with the um, you know, effects of microgravity on the plant immune system. Um, that's definitely something we can look into. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that connection. Thank you for um, telling us about it. Yeah, no, NASA's looking into it. I highly recommend. It's very cool. <laughs> okay, then I would uh, bring forward my questions again. Um, I actually have like two questions and one comment. Um, okay, let's go with the questions first. First question, you already showed actually the, the um, how you created basically the uh, kind of stim uh, simulated uh, like micro uh, 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 gravity, right? Um, by just basically putting a plant into a centrifuge uh, on a low setting. 
my question is rather simple why don't you just use that instead of magnetism in space like just put the plant in the centrifuge and stimulate uh, simulate the gravity um i guess the specific technical reason for that is obviously if you just spin something fast it generates a centrifugal force um and that centrifugal force might um uh, you know um now that centrifugal force, used, as you say, might be a replacement for um, some sort of other method for creating artificial gravity. Uh, but I guess something that was really driving the reason we chose to go for all this complexity was um, when we're on Earth, the um, gravity is essentially homogenous. Like um, it's, it essentially points straight down. Um, but we, we weren't completely certain if we um, instead put everything on a large centrifuge whether that would be, um, that would create the same sort of, uh, you know, um, homogenous force for all parts of the plant as it's spinning. Um, and I guess the other part of that too is um, we, we, we weren't entirely sure how that would be implemented in the National Space Station, um, especially since stuff that spins fast poses a lot of, um, you know, mechanical hazards. Um, I, we we kind of wanted to opt for something that, um, We'd kind of, you know, um, that, that we'd be able to more fine tune and also something that um, poses fewer risks potentially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, generally, uh, I would uh, prepare this in advance if you uh, go into like con considering like a few months in, in the future, I guess, uh, if you get into the questioning round with the um, with the judges, I would definitely prepare this question with um, ideally a little bit of like uh, ma math, etc., behind it. So, for example, okay, how fast do we actually like? For example, if we have a centrifuge, like how fast do these things have to spin? Um, or like perhaps even have like a little bit. There's probably some kind of evaluation about how reliable a centrifuge can be uh, to spin something into one specific direction. And in this case, you probably don't even need to make it like four plants, but like uh, you, could, you could even just go with a normal centrifuge. And there, there are very likely a bunch of papers about like how reliable um, directions, et cetera, et cetera like uh, the vectors are in this regard. So when, when someone asks you this, uh, that you have like a, an answer that like, because, because I think this is a question that you can prepare up to a point that like fucking knocks uh, every judge out of the chair. <laughs> um, and uh, because overall, I really like your project because it's like things out of the box. It's like a, a little bit special, et cetera. Um, just has to be like prepared Paired for uh, some question that might be very uh, hard to tackle. Um, my second question would uh, be assuming that uh, everything works, etc. Um, if we want to put a plant, uh, like basically ba like low key agriculture into space, like just just even on a rather small. Uh, smallest area etc um you would probably need to like stack plants up like you, you it, it's too inefficient to like just have them into one layer right like it would take up too much space in a such a station so ideally you would like have to like have an entire rack of uh of uh, these kind of plants um and systems the problem that came into my mind is like wouldn't that also cause because like if you stack them up right the magnetic field of the plants uh the the system above the other plants wouldn't it basically affect the ma magnetic uh like pull so so to say that you end up with um you can only do it in one layer otherwise the magnetic magnetic fields interact with each other have you thought about that 
Yeah, so I think the one interesting thing about um, you know, magnetic fields is that if you put everything inside of one large metal container, um, if you've ever seen the science demo, um, kind of when people take a radio and put it inside of a rubbish bin, the radio stops transmitting. Um, so essentially just putting um, everything inside of a metal container, I think uh, would allow us to isolate those, the effect of those fields. Um, and then um, the other thing, I guess the other part of that question is kind of related to how we would um, implement it if it went to space. Um, there's these, uh, the, kind of like to the racking question, there's actually a company called NanoRacks um, that basically can allow you to send projects to space and they give you some sort of space constraint and also 12 volt power supply. Um, and I, along those lines, this project is most applicable um, in that sort of uh, scenario, just um, you know, multiple racks, each growing one plant, um, just feeding in power supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also uh, as for the uh, uniformity of the magnetic field, if we're going to like you know grow more than one plant, um, this device is really just a fancy version of, of a really big magnet. We could have used a really big magnet, but we we're concerned about uh, we don't have access to like superconductors. So uh, the power requirement for a single magnet to generate a, a uniform field like we would want is going to be off the chart. Um, but if we're really growing this in space, uh, having a superconduct, uh, you know, a superconductive magnet uh, uh, will be a more efficient way to grow multiple plants. Uh, you know, in, in a uh, in a long rack, for example, you just put a magnet beneath them. And uh, yeah, this is exactly the same how uh, magnets attract uh, iron nails, but uh, on a um, micro scale. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then my second question, uh, I, I'm a little bit worried. I think actually uh, the people on Discord can't hear my question because I'm the one screaming, but okay, whatever. Fuck it. Uh, <laughs> they have to suffer then. Um, I, I, my, my second question is, wait, what was it? Uh, no, actually that was my second question, right? Um, <laughs> an additional problem, if you put them into, or rather something to keep in mind, if you put all the plants into metal boxes to keep the magnetic field separate from each rack, you have to keep in mind that you'd end up with um, the logistics of like, okay, you have to like basically uh, create um, a growth chamber for each and every plant that you put in onto like one rack. So it's like, yes, but also comes with a bunch of new challenges. Um, so yeah, just, just to keep that in mind. Um, because I, of course, if you put everything into a metal case, you need like lightning, you need air circulation, you need everything. Um, and the last little comment I wanted to say was, uh, I think I forgot that one. <laughs> Though I really love, uh, love your project. It's, uh, it's really nice. Uh, oh, my comment was about uh, your HP, basically. I would recommend, uh, I'm not sure if you already thought about this or whatever, but I would recommend try to just straight up go to um, NASA and other uh, big players in uh, this field and interview them like don't shy, don't don't be shy like worst thing they can do is say no um i'm not sure if you already planned something like that uh, but they're like go big go big or go home i guess in this uh, regard um <laughs> um there's no real reason to not at least try to get these big fishes on land and honestly uh, most of them will probably even say yes to you like an interview or statement um, any i guess specific recommendations for i don't know any specific organizations like obviously nasa is a big one but um um you can also try to be uh, like it's it's something you have to research, I guess. Um, you, you can you can also not only go for NASA, you can also go for other tech companies that are 
uh, around the globe. Like you don't have to stick to USA, I guess. Um, you can also go, for example, for space agencies in China or uh, Europe. Um, you can even ask the all these like new uprising send elon musk an email i don't know um, <laughs> uh, like just just be creative and uh, again just worst case these kind of people tell you no um, best case you get a very cool interview and can say yeah we had an interview with nasa or whatever But yeah, don't don't be shy. Um, try try to uh, reach out. That's basically it. <laughs> Sweet, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think also an interesting comment based on kind of what you said about the individual plant growth chambers. I think Tupperware or was it NASA developed a system called Ponds that they use for plant growth, and then Tupperware also developed a similar system um, for growing single plants. Um, and that, that's kind of done um, essentially what you said, kind of each plant um, being able to feed it oxygen and also feed it uh, water um, to the roots and also, um, you know, nutrients as well. So, um, yeah, there, there is a bit of precedent for that. And, uh, yeah. Okay. I think with that, we are going to conclude the session and the meeting itself. So, there we go. Just as a final remarks, we wanted to thank all of you for staying up uh, throughout the entire session. Um, the conference was really nice. And again, this is something that we want to expand throughout the years. And who knows, maybe try to bring something more to IGEM. We are thankful for all of our speakers and everyone that has participated, all those IGEM teams here, and all the ones that are still going to join us. We still have so, much, so many things to do. And I hope that this session has helped you to, to see the importance of what are you doing? Why, why are we working with Phototrust? And why is it so much so important for us to continue with our projects? I hope, and from the part of ASU and UBC Agent, that this was an interesting and nice opportunity for you to try to share more of how your project, get some feedback, and the conversation continues. We have the Slack, we have our mirror boards, and we are going to try to keep on working on this. We have the, um, our projects, so keep an eye on that. Um, with that said, thank you again to everyone, and yeah, thank you very much for coming to the to this conference. We hope you enjoyed. And before finishing, actually, uh, you know human practices, so I will ask you if you can turn on your cameras and let's take a final picture. I think I will uh, refrain from this because I would have to like build up everything right now. Sure. Then. Whoever can. Okay. Cool. So there we go. Thank you very much. So yeah, thank you very much again. And hope to see you soon. Stay active in the community. Recording Bye. stopped.